Coming to you live from the securely locked bathroom of the 13th room on the 13th floor of Western Europe's most haunted hotel, it's this week's Apocalypse. I'm your co-host Kevin Lenahan. With me as always is John Ferris. John, how are you doing today? You, you, you mean apart from being absolutely terrified? Well, I mean, we're in a fairly life-threatening situation right now. I guess we should uh, explain a little. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea to start some kind of... Um, Paranormal investigation show of some kind, you know, yeah. going yeah, to spooky I, places. I thought we were know. just going to scam people. Well, that's that comes with the editing afterwards, you know. I mean, that's that's the thing we didn't consider, you know, with uh, Zach Baggins and the Most Haunted People and all that. Yeah. They've got editing, whereas we decided we decided we just go in blind uh, with our night vision cameras and whatnot. So um, <laughs> that kind of brings me to the point of well. It's our night vision cameras that are the problem now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, being 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 attacked by uh, video recording equipment is, is horrifying. So, yeah, we shouldn't have come here. Uh, we're currently locked in this bathroom. Uh, there are, I'd say, seven or eight, what would you call them, possessed objects? Yeah. Would you say? Well, they are objects and they are possessed. So I, that's exactly yeah. what I'd call them. Um, they seem uh, they seem to all have at this point murderous intent at least. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are securely ensconced in here, but I'm not really sure for how long that's going to last. I mean, um, it's there, a hotel door. Like, there you know. seems to be a an old VCR player in the corner. Yeah, I noticed that as well. It's weird because like um, I'm about yeah like that's not something you generally just find lying around. No. Uh, these days, in fact, you probably get a lot for that on eBay. Yeah, <laughs> nowadays that might go for something. I don't think you get anything for it on eBay. Hi. So we've got like um uh we're we we're, were kind of wondering what the hell to do, and I've just sort of noticed we've got this a little stack of DVDs here, and a sort of gnarled old videotape here. Yeah. Um, well, we'll save that for later. Yeah. So I was looking at them, and I'm like, well, you know what? In any emergency situation, we know that the the best thing to do is sit down and watch a movie or three. Yep. So it's the only uh, course. It's the only reasonable course of action. Indeed. So I was looking through this wee stack here, and uh, we seem to have uh, three very useful movies. Oh, so uh, we have we have John Carpenter's Christine. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, we have Hideo Nakata's Ringu. Yeah. Or The Ring. Um, and we have Ivan Reitman's Ghostbusters 2. Oh. So, <laughs> I say, we sit down, we watch these three films, and we try and glean from them some kind of information to help get us out of the uh, sticky situation in which we seem to have found ourselves. All right? Yeah. Cool. Let's do it. Okay. So, um, now that that's done with, uh, we, I think we'll open here with uh John Carpenter's Christine. The another, another one where he's just he just loves slapping his name on the front yeah. of his films. When did like he it's, start that? I, he... I mean, he he did it in the thing. Uh, I don't think Halloween is John Carpenter's Halloween. Maybe no. maybe in releases after that, maybe it has that on it, John Carpenter's, because yeah. of the cachet of the name. But the thing. His original The Thing is known as, it says on the box, John Carpenter's The Thing. Uh, it's one of those things with like auteur directors that you get. I mean, you get like Francis Ford Coppola does that oh, sometimes. Yeah. And um, so sometimes... would you call this John Carpenter's Stephen King's, Christine? Yeah, see, that's a problem. It's We're back to <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, he definitely did it like with other films you're like john carpenter's vampires is the title of that movie yeah and john carpenter's ghost of mars is the title of that <laughs> oh, don't bring movie. it up again i uh, know sorry you know what i don't even know what what am i talking about i just made up a name of a film there apparently yeah it doesn't, uh, exist. It doesn't exist cool. anymore yeah so uh so for from 1983 john carpenter's christine yeah. john what did you think of john carpenter's christine I actually quite enjoy it. it it's yeah. it's it's one of those movies that uh, I th if you describe it to me, I just think I don't want to watch that. That's terrible. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> a, a possessed car. Okay, what? But uh, it it is actually quite quite good. It has issues, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Uh, particularly the third act has a lot of Yo, <laughs> lot man. of issues, mm-hmm. but um, I, I think it's done very well, and it's mm-hmm. it it's an original idea. I'll give them that. It is. See, the thing is, I have the opposite thing with this in a lot of ways, in that I hear the idea of a possessed <laughs> car, and I think that sounds friggin' awesome. Sign me up. <laughs> Uh, how how do you do that? I wonder in my head, yeah. and then you know you see it done, and you're like, oh, actually, that's quite clever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think yeah, this film does have uh, again, we're back to our old our old enemy of pacing problems. Yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> I think the middle third of this movie I think is great. Yes. I think the sort of the second act, if you will, um, I think it has a lot of problems in the first act of it takes almost too much time establishing the characters yeah uh characters that to be honest i don't necessarily like these characters very much like any of them they're, they're, um, I, I mean I, I i kind of enjoyed the the first act and all this introduction because there's like ridiculous things of like a lot of the students who go to the school particularly mm-hmm. the bully yeah looks about 40 yeah, now I did look it up because I had exactly the same concerns as you. <laughs> now, no one is the age they're supposed to be, which you no. expect. I mean, ever since Dawson's Creek, that's just been assumed <laughs> that people are going to be way older. So uh, the guy playing the bully was 25. I he believe they're older. supposed he to be. Looks yeah, than he looked. He looks like a man who has drunk and smoked himself into old age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he was actually, I was shocked when I looked up what age he was. Yeah. Uh, because he looks, he looks older than I do now. <laughs> um, but I, th- yeah, I thought he, he was one of the teachers when he appeared. I was like, yeah, that guy's, that teacher's a bit, a bit of a dick. Yeah, well, that teacher shouldn't be bullying students like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I mean, one of the main um, actors in it are all obviously older than they should. Like John Stockwell, who... Uh, plays dennis who is the the, kind the, of the main... sort of the protagonist he's yeah. not the victim of the car but he's like yeah. the guy's friend and we do sort of follow his perspective through most of the film uh he was he was actually about the same age as that guy yeah <laughs> um yeah so i mean the, they're, they're all playing 17 year olds but they're all about five to seven years too old to be doing that yeah. some in some cases more obvious than others oh yeah definitely um, like as soon as it goes to the school it, like you, you're just looking around going what kind of weird sc- is everyone just being held back is this town like <laughs> is there mercury in the water and everyone's it's just remedial mental? yeah <laughs> yeah everyone's so minds I've... are destroyed so they all have to be held back a year mm-hmm. or so, yeah, sorry I, many I... years yeah like five to seven years apparently (laughs) yeah so yeah i find the first sort of chunk of it to be they spend a lot of time they spend a lot of time before we even get to the car establishing these characters which you know well i mean it's got it's actually even more disappointing because at the very very start you've got christine's being manufactured Mm -hmm. and then uh the the bonnet closes on someone's hand she's a guy she chews a guy's hand up initially kind of yeah i mean that could be an accident the guy shouldn't have really had his hand kind of there you know Mm -hmm. it it, it just works safe guys and then (laughs) there's there's a guy who like sits in it and i mean no matter what this guy he he flicks ice on the seat Mm -hmm. dude that's not fucking cool this is a fucking new car and you're just ashing all over and he um, works there. He's like inspecting it and stuff. Yeah, like he should be yeah. the person who's like telling people off for doing that stuff. Yeah. So Christine obviously takes this. Yeah, I'd be pretty pissed off if someone iced in my insides, <laughs> in your belly or whatever that is. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm but, not sure how car anatomy works. Yeah. Oh, but it, it kind of she she just kills him somehow. We don't know how. We don't know. He just mm. kind of falls out of the car dead, and then that's kind yes. of. He just, generically dies. Yeah, yeah. generically. She, she's very good at generically killing people. Uh-huh. Um, which is a bit disappointing because, again, I was like, I was more... I mean, I've seen this, I seen this movie years ago, so this, mm-hmm. this is another one of these ones that I'm kind of coming back to going, oh, this is going to be bad. But I was ple- pleasantly surprised, but I yeah. was disappointed that there wasn't more inventive ways for the car to kill someone. Yeah, they're weirdly referential. I mean, if you've read the book, which I have uh, yeah. a long time ago again, but they they skim over some stuff a little bit uh, that maybe they should have addressed with a line here or there in the film. Yeah. But the way that... 
Well, basically, I mean, essentially, the the car is sort of converts the main character Arnie, Arnie Cunningham, yeah. who a, a proto Woody Allen, if you will. Oh yeah, I mean, he is cribbing <laughs> hard. He is very much that kind of yeah. jittery, nervous, annoying guy. Yeah. yeah. They buy the car in the in the in the film. They amalgamate the man who sells them the car. They amalgamate two characters from the book, uh, and in him, uh, he talks about his older brother, who owned the car and who yes. was a mean son of a bitch, and that he only loved this car, and that his wife died in a car and his daughter died in the car. Uh, in the books, in the book. Uh, he actually buys the car from that guy, the guy that he's talking about. Yeah. He buys the car from the guy who owned it. And then that guy dies later. And then his friend goes back and talks to the guy's younger brother who then tells yeah. him all that stuff. So they, so they clearly just wanted to save money mm-hmm. on actors. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Or maybe, maybe maybe for the sake of brevity, they were just like, well, we can't have this happen and then have someone go back and then race yeah. that. I mean, he does go back to him, though. His friend does go back and talk to the guy. Yeah, go, but, goes back to uh, Old Man from Home Alone. Old Man from Home Alone, who was <laughs> even then an old man. Yeah. Uh, like 10 or 11 years before. <laughs> yeah, 10 or 11 years before Home Alone, he's still playing that weird old man. <laughs> yeah. So they have amalgamated the two brothers into the one character for the sake of exposition. Yeah, uh, but you know we are told of the other brother. So essentially, what is happening is that Arnie, by being in possession of the car and being close to the car, is becoming that guy. He's slowly yeah. turning into the guy's older brother, who the angry older brother. And what they don't specifically they, they tell you that the guy's daughter choked in the back seat. Yes. Now specifically, she choked on a burger. Mm-hmm. Which is something that happens to someone in the car later. Yeah. They choke as well in the same way they choke on food. Uh, so, in a way, it's sort of like echoing that. And also, there's the whole thing that his wife died of like mon- carbon monoxide poisoning, but it was like a suicide, like a hose on the pipe. Yeah. She fed inside and choked herself. And I, whether or not. Uh, that was the car doing that to people in fact is or they never specifically say they don't even imply it really no um, no it's, it's kind of just glossed over it's, it's it, you kind of go and know what you're watching as well you know oh yeah so yeah it's in some ways it's implied just with that oh this car there's death all around it and mm-hmm. every you know the owner it's everyone, very Stephen King he seemed, yeah everyone <laughs> yeah. he seems to have loved apart, apart from the brother um, mm. has died. Yeah, the brother who car. owned it for a, who who's kept it apparently for a while. Now again, in the book, that's not the case. No, in the book, the brother hasn't kept it for a while. But in this, in the context of this film, that brother's had it sitting on blocks outside his house. Yeah, for uh, years now, and, I have and it to hasn't say, killed like, him. You know, it looks really bad for a just. It's twenty years old. Like <laughs> twenty know. years, you can look after a car for, especially if you love this car. Yeah, you know, it's terrible looking. It's extremely fucked up, and I think <laughs> yeah. they they deliberately do that so that you get obviously that high contrast between what it looks like when he gets it and yeah. how miraculously fixed it becomes. Yes, yeah. a little later, and the, the, there's also that thing. It, it it helps because a lot of these possessed item kind of are <clears throat> the, these uh, uh, things that are that, that that are possessed. They they have this kind of common trope where they kind of call the people, they draw draw people mm. to them. Yeah, there's a temptation for some yes. reason, like, like the ring in Lord of the Rings, you know, it's yeah, like there's exactly. this weird hunger for it that people don't understand. Because even uh, in the in the next, in, in Ghostbusters 2 and Ringu, it's, it's mm-hmm. the same thing. At, at some point or another, people are drawn to this thing that you, you wouldn't think you would be. And it's the same with Christine. She basically calls out to Artie and he's completely besotted with this car and everyone's looking at it going that is a tri-shape yeah like it catches his eye when they're driving past and he's just like oh my god look at that car and his mate rightly so is like dude it's a (laughs) shit heap it's not worth buying and even then he's like and you're talking like it's set it was made in it came out in 1983 but the film's set in the early 70s yeah. Uh, I think um, so. God, is it nineteen? Uh, is it set in nineteen seventy eight? 
Yes, think, yeah, because it's, it's, it's 20 yeah. years after... I, th- I think Christine's built in 1957. Yeah. And I think it's actually 20, what, 21 years later. If, if yeah, I so it's right. officially a classic. He makes that, like, once a car is like over 20 years old, <laughs> yeah. I think it, it's officially a classic car. Really? And he's like, yeah, dude, you want, you can call this a classic all you want, but look at the hack of it. No, I do think that it is a cool looking car. Oh, yeah. Once, well, once, once he like, fixes it all up. And, yeah. and by the way, like he fixes it up by himself. It's, it's implied mm-hmm. that at this stage, Christine is not, presenting herself as like she she hasn't kind of outed herself as she can fix herself and things like this yeah he does this he all sees, by himself he and sees it, that happen later and is yeah. surprised but pleased oh, by yeah. it um that's the point at which he is he is yeah he's gotten fully weird i mean he's kind of fully weird about the car almost immediately from the moment he sees it, but like he gets very, very weird about the car. But knowing a lot obsessed. of auto heads, I, I'll just call them auto heads. Mm. I know a few people who are really, really obsessed with their cars, yeah. and they did, do come across as a bit creepy and a did bit. You see a bit of a them in Gollum-esque. <laughs> yeah, precious. <laughs> there's, there's one guy in particular who I, I think you could probably punch his wife and kids before you could. <laughs> touch his car he would be fine with the, with the other ones he'd be like oh yeah what did they do to you but if you like even brushed against his car in the wrong way he would uh-huh. go full on psycho on you oh my he sounds like lots of fun oh he's delightful <laughs> yeah <laughs> he actually is oh. he's a nice guy otherwise yeah okay I, i'm just gonna take that on faith uh, so <laughs> yeah i mean as but the so the film is basically about him becoming more and more obsessed with the car and the car protecting itself and sort of protecting him he, he in kind a way. Of goes, he, he goes from like Woody Allen to kind of a Bruce Springsteen uh, type caricature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does. Uh, I think that's because that's the character in the book, the character that he he's becoming, that guy, the guy that sold him the car. Yeah. And that guy was a 50s greaser. I thought like you were going to say that guy was Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. No, that would be that'd be weird to see for Stephen King to write him in, but yeah. maybe not that weird. Actually, he's done weirder stuff. Oh, he has done a lot weirder stuff. We'll yeah. not talk about. So. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he is becoming the guy that used to own the car, and it's sort of a love story, but like a toxic yeah. love story between two people who are obsessed with each other. But it's sort of the car and this man and they're both obsessed with each other and he's becoming this guy that used to love the car and the car yeah. sort of turning it turning him into that and it's protecting him and it's it's eventually starts murdering people who threaten it and also threaten him yeah um in fact uh the main sort of motivator for that being when they smash his car up yeah, and they, they really sm- oh my they smash it up hardcore oh, that, like yeah that's that's like, crazy they broke a lot of plymouths uh yeah. making this movie because yeah. oh my god that car they really mangle it like they have a sledgehammer and they show up and you see them breaking bits of it I but then when when you flash forward to the next day and he shows up and finds the car broken it's like it looks like it's been through some kind of crushing machine <laughs> or something it's like it's the engines like coming out and everything I, I, I have to laugh though at the when when they get there they kind of dance around it see it's the the five is it five of them or four i think it's five of the these bully guys and headed by our 40 year old uh yeah, a 40, 40 year old, old looking 25 year old playing a 17 year old <laughs> yeah yeah and like they kind of dance around the car like they're they're in greece or something and this yeah. actually the, the first time you meet them when they're bullying Artie when he's still in his kind of woody allen mm-hmm. phase they they kind of are similar they, they, they look they kind of look and they feel like they're going to burst out into song like in greece it's, or something they they comport themselves in a choreographed way as yeah. if <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely like I've taken four years of tap and three years of interpretive dance. <laughs> the way they move around him and like the way even like the guy pulls his knife is so theatrical. Yeah, but like West Side kinda, Story. <sighs> yeah, exactly. It's exactly like something from West Side Story. Um, I don't know if that's deliberate or not, but I enjoyed that. Oh whenever yeah, whenever they were doing that, it's fun to watch. Again, you can just laugh at it. But yes, yeah. so they they wreck the car and one of them takes a shit on the dashboard, which yeah. 
which we don't see happen, really? thank Christ. No. <laughs> but Harry Dean Stanton, uh, the great, the late great Harry Dean Stanton, yes. who is the cop who's investigating uh, yeah. the death of the first guy, who which eventually comes, um, he's the one that mentions that whenever he's talking to Arnie, and he's yeah. like, because he obviously suspects him because he's the last person to have like a beef with these guys and one of them shows up dead yeah um and he's he mentions that and he's like oh well shit wipes off and you're like <laughs> okay but you know still yeah, yeah and the, the, the ver- first victim is kind of the the rotund member of the of he the, is yes of the bullies and uh he has a an, an unusual fighting style early on in the film <laughs> Who where he, he just kind of grabs you by the dick Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's so... Yeah. It just comes out of nowhere. Yep. It's kind of like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> yeah, I don't and, know. Uh, when Christine is chasing him, he... Uh, for for a guy of like quite large proportion... He, he can move like... pretty damn yeah. fast. Yeah, he gets... yeah, Which actually kind of brings me quite neatly to something I think we'll be talking about a lot uh, in this episode. The effects in this film. Now, yeah. especially for 1983. I think... If you made this film today, yeah. they would just do some CG mm-hmm. and you'd be like, whatever. And you'd see it and you'd be like, okay, that's uh, CG. That's a car. Because after they smash the car up, the car fixes itself Yeah. in a way that... And I haven't seen this film in a long time. And watching it now, I was like, that looks really good. When like, the car's reforming and undenting itself. Yeah, it looks incredible. really impressive. That bit's really, really impressive. But then, when it goes after him, there is a particular moment where he has run down this little sort of delivery bay almost yeah. that looks like, and yet, like the car gets right up to it, and it's that it's there at the edge of the delivery bay, and it's revving its engine, and it's too thin for the car to get in. It's just about, yeah. it's maybe a couple of inches on each side, too far in for the car to get in and obviously he's gone down there he thinks he's safe and then the car starts revving and pushing forward and crumples up against the walls in a way that i just find incredibly satisfying <laughs> for some reason as it pushes in like a fucking animal that's just trying to get it's like it's like a dog trying to get into a hole at a rat or something you yeah, know it, it pushing it, itself in it becomes like a, a rabid beast at, at that point yeah and it's it, it's especially important that, uh, that that happens because up to that point, you're kind of going, well, dude, just climb some ladders. Just like, Aye. just do something. Just like hide in a corner. Like a car isn't going to be able to get you everywhere. But yeah, Christine <laughs> kind of can. I mean, it yeah, still doesn't yeah. explain why they don't just run up ladders to get away from. Indeed, yeah. But it, it it's willing to like sort of completely mangle itself to get yeah. at this guy. And that's actually it's it's actually kind of frightening when it happens. You think, oh, that's stupid, and then you see it. You're like, because he he actually, starts really, really getting scary. confident when he realizes, oh, the car can't fit. Because yeah, he starts sh- shouting at him mind, and this stuff. This guy just yeah. thinks it's Artie, and yeah. his and his somehow miraculously fixed car. He's just like, yeah, come out and fight me yourself. And it's just like, mm-hmm. no, <laughs> no, this car wants to fucking eat you. And yeah. then like they tell you later, you know, that he was mangled from the waist down. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, yeah, this thing chewed him up and spat him out. And, like that's <laughs> so nasty. Uh, yeah. So the effects, I think, work really, really well. Um, and actually towards the end, there's some really, really cool stuff. It's a bit silly. Yeah. Um, but it, I think... In concept, it's a bit silly, but to be honest, when you see it, uh, like there's a point where it gets really mangled at the front, and the front of the car looks like a jagged <laughs> mouth. Yeah, and that's actually kind of like it, it's equal like, parts awesome and yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> like when you first see it, you're like ha, and then you look at it for a few seconds, and you're like, oh my god, that's actually fucking terrifying. <laughs> if that was coming at you, because it's literally now got a mouth and wants to fucking chew them up. <laughs> Because during this time, and, and and this is kind of the high high point of the, of the movie, is is that middle part where it's basically mm-hmm. a revenge story at this point. And yeah, Christina's killing these these bully characters who mm-hmm. who destroyed it. The same time we're getting we're getting the uh, Dennis um, is worried about his the changes in his friend Artie, and yeah. there, there's also the the new girl in school Lee. Oh Is yeah, it? again, which which brings us back to like why I don't like these characters. Yeah. Um like they they try to write them as like ha, these are like high school kids <laughs> and these are high school 
boys and then so let's just have them make a bunch of vulgar comments yeah but at the, at the same time it just it just made me really really dislike them as people yeah when they were doing that it was like uh, like like one of them makes the most stupid comment <laughs> i have ever uh, one of the most stupid comments i've ever heard in a film where he says she looks real smart, but she's got the body of a slut. I was like, "Yeah, Jesus Christ, mate! What the fuck? <laughs> what is your problem?" And it was, it was at that point where it was like, maybe I don't remember this film properly. <laughs> you know, maybe this film's actually bad all the way through. It sets a poor tone. And I, like, I, there's a lot of that shit in the first, the first act of it. Yeah, you know, that happens a lot. I, I, and I was I, like, I don't like these guys. Yeah, and I, I don't think it helps that uh, that Lee as a Lee doesn't have much of a character either she's no she's very she's, much a prop in this movie, yeah which, she's a prop until she's like a damsel in distress yeah like she's there to be threatened and the and only then, the only other female character that you really have who, who any who gets any kind of screen time is uh Artie's mum who mm. is just just oh, she's just the worst like i mean yeah. from the moment you meet her quite early on she's mm-hmm. she's like an uh dennis who seems like a fairly all right guy yeah of, know, of all of the high school kids in it he's the least offensive yeah i would say you know and you would kind of realize your son's a bit of an outcast especially well they kind uh, of almost manufacture his life like that you know they force him yeah. to join the chess club instead of the band and stuff like this uh, he goes through that list of things whenever <laughs> yeah. he brings the car home about like all the things he's done that they wanted him to do yeah. just give me this one thing and they still they won't let him park the car at home yeah <laughs> they has to go and rent this dive this nasty like <laughs> grody like do-it-yourself scrapyard yeah. place to keep his car uh so i don't know i mean it it, it does have a certain sort of self-pitying whine to them oh yeah to him oh no the he, he's time. the worst he just he, mm. need, he just needs a good slap but the yeah the, the mom like she likens Dennis playing music on the radio, and not even that loud. Uh, she likens it to like him dumping toxic waste onto yeah. their. Onto yeah, their she house. says it's that like, like yeah, she literally calls it that. Um, yeah. Like it's not like like it's not even like it's that offensive music even. No, it's just it's just a little bit of it's a little bit of generic rock and roll. You're like <laughs> whatever, it's fine. I think that's the there again. They're drawing from um, the Stephen King there. Yeah, with uh, the with Stephen that King. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, they're drawing from oh, like in the Latin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the Stephen King. You know, that is just directly lifted from the books of like where he is paint. He paints the mother in this sort of caricature way where she yeah. does just say ridiculous, over the top things like that. Yeah. a lot um now maybe that's per characterization i don't know but in the, in the book it's it's pulpy and it's kind of fun yeah because it's it's an easy way to establish uh here's something for this guy to reel against oh yeah and uh, and and it works in the movie as well yeah because uh, you i mean from the very instant you meet her you're like uh oh, she, yeah, she she's sucks the worst. but <laughs> again um that's that's where this problem with with lee comes from is she mm-hmm. just doesn't have much of a character and in fact yeah when she starts getting a wee bit kind of she starts getting disturbed about uh christine and like how he already acts with it but mm-hmm. from everything that's kind of happening you you don't see much more from her perspective other than like uh the date they have going to the the outdoor cinema um uh, the, the drive. Where she nearly chokes again yeah. much like yeah they were they're trying to echo the guy's daughter that died but I, 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 yeah. I kind of think you could have a very you could edit this movie in such a way that it could be about a girl who is insane and jealous of a car because yeah, because of the things really she's says. saying. Yeah, she says some stuff about the car that if you did, if we as the audience did not know that this was really happening, we yeah. would think she's a fucking basket case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I mean, again, it's it's one of the problems uh, of when when you. Uh, convert a, a book into a movie is that you're mm. you're always going to miss those kind of those those inner thoughts and those feelings yeah. and like when you just know something's wrong and you can explain what a character's going through a, a lot more in depth in a book that always gets lost in movies that, yeah when it comes to prose um you can describe a character's motivations without dialogue whereas in a yeah. film i mean in a film you can communicate stuff like that as well but um there is something that uh short of just slapping narration of someone's internal monologue yeah. over the top which 
it, very often is is not the thing to do. If no, I if I, I can, anything, I can, I can it, have disastrous yeah. results. If I learned anything from the original cinema cut of Blade Runner, it's that maybe <laughs> don't put narration in when it's not needed. Yeah, yeah. So that is a problem there, I guess. In that, yeah, she seems to be acting crazy about the car, but we as the audience know that there's something yeah. up with the car. And the the car does try to kill her. I mean, it's like she starts to choke, and then the light inside the car gets supernaturally bright. Yeah. While he's outside, sort of trying to get her out, but not trying that hard, no. really. <laughs> She's going to freak out whenever a uh, sensor or motion sensor lights are invented, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going to be like, oh, no, it's all happening again. <laughs> yeah. So that sort of middle third is, is a very good, um, I think, the effects of the way the car moves and stuff, yeah. I think, is great. The way it behaves, I think they do a really good job of making it almost seem like an animal. Yeah. Like, the way it revs its engine like it growls and like the way it like almost like i don't know it's like the suspension moves in it as if it's like arching up and changing position and stuff yeah. is like i mean it it it's L- really like kind good. of like a big cat getting on its hind yeah. legs kind of thing it's yeah, yeah they, they, they do very well with that not and also the uh when it's on fire it looks pretty damn cool when it's oh my god me and yes. bully guy yeah, when it's chasing him down the road and it's like it has driven through their like the gas station where one of them works and they've all gathered to hang out and like it plows in there and just wrecks two of them and sets yeah. fire to the place and then yeah it's chasing him covered in fire that is one of the coolest visuals in horror cinema <laughs> is it just because it's like it's not even at that point it's playing with him yeah. because he's running down the road and it's sort of it's sort of following him down the road just ever so slightly faster than he's running <laughs> as it just slowly catches up with him and it's just you can see the the flames licking over it and then it just sort of rolls over him and drives <laughs> off and he's there and the, he's mangled on the ground on fire and you're like yeah that's a that's a really scary movie monster yeah and i think it's i think they do a really good job with making it seem alive and angry yeah you know and like giving it almost like a human motivation at that point where it's or even maybe your your thing about like the cat like i hope the way a cat will play with something yeah. before it kills it yeah, it's it's kind of doing that to him there except it's also on fire at the time <laughs> which makes it way more intimidating no but it, it yeah that I, I thought it's I, I thought it was very well done um hmm. so yeah the, that's kind of you know that that is your middle part that's that's as good as this movie gets unfortunately yeah yeah after that um dennis starts to he starts talking to lee a bit more about Mm. Artie and the changes in them and they're convinced uh again very unrealistic on dennis parts yep the car is evil he's had very little dealings with it he's too quick to believe that the car is evil that is true he has not really got any evidence i mean he knows these guys are being killed oh yeah uh and he knows that ever since his friend got the car he seems different yeah but he hasn't seen the car like murder anybody (laughs) like she has a bit more justification because she feels like the car's tried to kill her uh, yeah. Which it has. The car has tried to kill her. Um, I mean, you can't be... Obviously, it's like, oh, she choked and then the door's locked on the car. Like, you could explain that away, but, you know, she's convinced yeah. and she's right. It's it's, it's just yeah. an unhappy coincidence. Yeah, it could be, indeed. Uh, but, yeah, he doesn't really have much of a reason to blame the car. No. Because no. he got injured. He gets injured in the film Yeah, while he is playing football. Yeah, now, well, I think they try to, own... like... In the book, they try to blame the car for that, and I think that's <laughs> why they're sort of trying to communicate that in the film. But they don't give you a reason to believe that in the movie. No. It's just that he sees uh, Arnie and Lee get out of the car in the in the parking lot as he's running down the football field in his football gear, yeah. supposed to catch the ball, and then he gets distracted by looking at them or maybe the car. <laughs> I think it seems easy. He's... It seems very much it's looking at them. It seems like because he yeah. he tries to make a pass at her with the the worst pickup line ever of "Do you like music?" <laughs> no, no, man, nope. I, I I don't have ears. No, nah, nobody likes music. Me if if like. someone does not like music, they do not deserve to be talked to anyway. My God, John! <laughs> oh, 
making statements. Yeah. So you are. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty, like, you know, it doesn't matter what music you like. It's, you, you're bound <laughs> to like some music. Yeah, you're drawing a line in the sand there. Are you? Yeah. If you don't like music, you're a psycho. <laughs> yeah, there's something wrong. With you. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. So yeah, he's. So is it that? Yeah, he's all surprised. I think in the film, it just seems like he's surprised that his nerdy friend has picked up this girl. Yeah. Basically, that she's deigning to spend time with him. Um, but uh, I feel like it's also like, is he being mesmerized by the car in the distance and not paying attention? Which and is a bit of a dick gets... move. To... Oh, mm. my, my mate's going out with the uh, attractive new girl. Oh, there's something sinister going on. Uh, yep, yeah, that's Devin's. That must be the car's possessed. Yeah. That's the only explanation. She him over me? Oh, yeah. there's something, something eerie going on here. Yeah, yeah, creepy, creepy. So, yeah, that whole thing is a bit... Like, that has nothing to do with the car, as far as I'm concerned, in the no. movie. No, it's no. not. It doesn't... They don't make that apparent enough. But anyway, he becomes convinced yeah. that by her that, oh, yeah, the car's evil and we have to stop Lee, him. Lee convinces him through, there's something not right with the car. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't think the car is, is normal. There's something yeah. different with Artie. That's basically your mm. argument. And he goes, yeah, fuck, you're right. Yeah. The car but, is possessed. Uh, but then he does go for a ride with him and then weird stuff does happen. Uh, like, he lets him pick him up and then he, like, is driving down the road and he, like, he takes his hand off the wheel. Yes, yeah. But then the car sort of starts to drive itself. So there is that at that point. But that's after he sort it's of got convinced. <laughs> exactly. It's just a Plymouth <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, he does like go. Ah, I'm taking my hand off the wheels, and they're like, "Don't be so reckless, dude!" And he's like, yeah, he's th- this is while drinking. he's drink driving as well. So yes. he's went fully dick. He's he's a complete dickhead at this point. Yeah, he's gone fully like I am this sort of 1950s stereotype. Uh, the guy that went off Dead Man's Point, yeah. you know, on the night of the prom or whatever. He's doing that. He's wearing his leather jacket and he's drinking behind the wheel and he's driving too fast. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to be reckless. And he takes his hand off the wheel and then the car takes the corner, yeah. even though he's not doesn't have his hands on the wheel. And he's like, oh no, the car is evil. And then that's enough. That's enough for his mate to be like, I'm going to destroy this car in the most clumsy way possible. <laughs> <laughs> in the most, with the worst. Like, their plan, I'm still not sure what their plan was, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, the- yeah, it it makes very little to no sense. Yeah, I mean, what were they hoping to achieve? Like, they get a digger and they're like, I'm going to get this, well, a, a JCB vehicle of some kind. Yeah. It has a big bucket thing on the front of it anyway. And they're like, I guess they want to like, I guess his plan is to just fight the car with it. Yeah. Um, it it but... doesn't make for a very exciting third act. It, it, again, as you said before, uh, pacing problems, the third yeah. act drags on while it does. he tries to kind of navigate this uh, this digger and yeah. attack. Like, he, you're just like, he doesn't know how to drive it. And they, they, <laughs> they sort of imply that he sort of knows how to drive it. But then you're like, you're, it's almost like you're watching somebody figure out how to drive <laughs> one of these things in real time. <laughs> <laughs> and Christine kind of outsmarts him as well yeah. by hiding in a few boxes, which is never well. Yeah, how Artie did... helps as well. You imagine he's actually yeah. This is one of the few times where you actually see that he is in the car yeah. at this point, while it's you know him and the car are one now. I guess is the idea yeah. at that point. Um, but yeah, I don't know what their plan was. It's it's hiding under some rubble, and uh, yeah, you imagine maybe I guess he hid it there. Yeah, he would uh, have to. But... Well. We're never really shown Christine no. kind of, you know, I've never seen her, like, stack boxes. <laughs> no, she doesn't have big freaky demonic arms that come yeah. out and move things around or anything. It's just sort of like, oh, this is this is now the, the situation in which the car has found itself somehow. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they have a sort of a driving around. That, now, that is the point where you do get the cool sort of, the front of it is all messed up and yeah. it looks like a jagged mouth because it's like fighting this like um piece of equipment that he's yeah. driving around and it's getting torn up um and i kind of like it, the, the the at one point uh, it, the the first time christine kind of attacks uh or is uh, is trying to attack lee and they get the digger to kind of ram it a bit and stuff christine's all damaged and she kind of reverses into the shadows and when she comes out again she's pristine again uh, I, I kind of liked that wee moment it was it was kind of cool 
like it goes and hides and recovers and then comes jumping yeah. out again. You're like, oh, well, all the stuff we did to it was pointless yeah. <laughs> because it's a monster. But uh, yeah, and yeah, they do some good stuff. Like it is fun to watch a car get wrecked. I mean, I, that's just yeah. that's just true. Um, so <laughs> that that fight is fun when the car is getting smashed and then it's back to being pristine again. And like, oh, great, we get to see this car get smashed up again. <laughs> cool. I mean, that's like the appeal of monster trucks. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly the destruction yeah. derby is popular for for a reason all uh, right so they do sort of wangle about and eventually they sort of crush the car and then drive over it and then yeah. drive over it again that, and then that drive seems over it really lots. annoying because lee just stands there completely yeah. dumbfounded it, again just really cementing her role as a prop and not a person um, she just stands, and you. I think at that point you're kind of going, "What is anyone doing here? Like, no one has a plan." Yeah, yeah, it, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I still don't understand what they were planning to do. They get to the point where, like, oh, when the car comes in, you close the gate, and yeah. that's it. That's the extent <laughs> of the plan. It's not, and then we will do this. No, yeah. then it's just, I guess we'll just clart around in this, uh, in in this sort of um, this earth moving machine and see what happens <laughs> uh, which eventually sort of works out for them but only because the plot demands it i guess but ultimately i think i think it sort of shakes out being altogether like a pretty good movie yeah um, yeah it's fine yeah and it's it's a movie that uh became like it's a movie that gets referenced a fair bit in popular culture yeah. you'll see other things like um there's an episode of Futurama that is basically like Christine where Bender is like a war car and he turns oh, into... Oh, yes. That's... A, it's sort of an American werewolf Christine amalgamation almost. <laughs> there's a, there's a also uh, the, one of the episodes of Ash vs. Evil Dead. Yeah, Com- it, it does a wonderful homage mm-hmm. to it. it where is some of the deaths in that mm-hmm. are oh. very gruesome and very, oh, yeah. very well done. There's one in particular where they back wheel... The wheel? Yep. spins and gets closer and closer to the guy's face until it ultimately completely mangles it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which, again, is, is just what I said earlier. You know, you, you want to think of ways that how can this car uniquely kill someone, you know, or, or, or mm. re- really lean into the fact that it's a, a car. Yeah, like a car can't manipulate things. It doesn't have arms and legs. You know, yeah. it's got it's got wheels. But it's got um, wheels and doors and yeah. is, is a big metal box that can yeah. just run through people. Like it, again, like the you know, it being on fire and like slowly creeping up mm-hmm. on that main bully guy is is really awesome and really cool. But I, I would have loved more more wee things like that. Yeah, yeah, like whenever they sort of show its intent almost. Yeah. You know, and like the way that it has to go about murdering people <laughs> because it's it's not this animal, but yeah. it, it has like the mind of an animal, but it's in something that isn't designed to climb on things or pick things up. It has to just like bludgeon things to death with its face, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also and I, I also appreciate that it's never explained. You don't know. You you don't know why Christine. Yeah, is why is the you car possessed? Yeah. Why is it evil? Yeah, they don't really address that. The the most you get is just that sort of like from the moment it rolled off the production line, yeah. it was evil, which is yeah. actually just a really good line. It could be just exact from a Stephen King short story right yeah. there. From the moment she rolled off the line, she was cursed. <laughs> it's like why I don't know. Yeah, but I I, I, I kind of like that. I, I think a lot a lot of a lot of times horror horror mo- uh, movies have a problem with trying to over explain. Yeah. Or, or especially sequels, you know, uh, you've got the origins of the nun now. You've got, you know, they go through all these origin things, and sometimes it's just yeah. best to leave it like, why? It's more frightening. The unknown is more frightening, and they they don't well uh, up up to this date, they haven't made a Christine origin movie. They might. no, <laughs> I mean, don't you may have just willed it into existence. <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> Yeah, well, ultimately, I think I think this film is successful in uh, what it sets out to do, which is turn a car into a movie monster. Yeah, um, I think they do a really good job of that, to be honest. Um, and like, I don't know if it was it was successful enough. I think when it come come out, but it is considered to be like a cult yeah. hit. Yeah, now because it is such an odd 
thing. Like a lot of John Carpenter stuff actually is like successful like after the fact. Yeah. Like I mean the thing the thing bombed in the cinema. <laughs> But when it came out on VHS, it did extremely well. Like, it just crept. This sort of creeping success. Just crept just into like, people's hearts. Indeed. Uh, possibly <laughs> even into... Christine may have crept into my heart. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think it's... Uh, watch it's out very... for the carbon monoxide, though. I know, I know. <laughs> Oof. It's bad for the heart, I hear. Yep. Yeah, so, I yeah, I think Christine's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would agree. All right, well, that brings us on to Hideo Nakata's Ringu, then. Um, now, this is a film that is sort of historically seen as being, um, I guess, they refer to it as a genre, J-horror, which yeah. um, I, don't know, I think that's very reductive to to, to do that. Um, but this is sort of considered to be a horror classic a modern horror classic of 1998 you know stretching yeah. the term of modern maybe at this point <laughs> uh but uh it's here a, it's it's more than 20 years it's clearly a classic indeed that's the rules of christine <laughs> right there and cars so uh john what did you think of hideo nakata's ringo i really like ringo i, I remember mm. seeing it when it came out i uh, yeah. And yeah, it, it kind of started this, uh, as you say, this whole J horror thing, which I think more or less happened because a lot of horror movies, a lot of Western horror movies, were kind of lacking, and there was, mm. there was they were mainly just going by the numbers. And I, I think in the nineties, it was it, it suffered a lot. The 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 most of the horror movies we were getting were just these generic. You could you could almost tell exactly what was going to happen mm-hmm. um of course uh, there are outliers you know there, there there always is um and maybe you could argue that this was always the case for for an, any genre of uh, yeah movie. i think if you, even if you go back to like maybe like back to the 50s and for, moving forward you know you've got all those films that you would probably look at now even like then i mean they, they were literally b movies you know it was yes. like yeah. it was like you would go and you would go to a, a cinema and you would pay for which is something I would kind of love to bring back, but I don't know if my bladder can handle it. Um, <laughs> where you go to the cinema and you pay for a ticket and you get to see two films. Yeah, and make an evening the, off it. Yeah, there would be the A feature and the B feature. Yeah. And theoretically, the B feature would be a sort of a cheaper sort of... Schlocky kind of... <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes those B movies would end up being, you know, things that would become classics. Sometimes but... they would become more popular than the A movies. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Uh, but, um, like, you know, people would you just sort of, like, look at it and be like, there was a slew of horror was, like, the easy thing to do for that. Yeah. To get people in and screaming and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So you got, like, a lot of... Horror's always been a, a genre that's been filled with trash. Yeah. Uh, and then whenever there's a really good sort of uh, thing in there, it's usually it's it's really good. Yeah. You know, when you get something that stands out from the sort of slew and of I think, crap. I think for the time that this came out, it, this mm. did stand out. Um, oh, yes. Like, I had never I had never seen a film quite like this no. before I saw this movie. I saw this movie probably when I was about 15, yeah. maybe 15, 16, I think. Uh, probably about a year after it came out. Uh, yeah. Whenever they... Well, yeah, whenever... I said it, I'd seen it when it came out, but it was probably mm. the same. It was... You know, a yeah. bit of time had passed, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think I watched this film on a literal VHS cassette <laughs> tape. <laughs> which is appropriate for yep. this movie. Um, yeah. So, but, uh, I... Yeah. It, it mm. uh, It's very confident as well, in, in the mm-hmm. sense that there's not actually that much horror scenes in it. There's, there's not yep. a lot of... It does have a few problems, which we'll get into, but... For the most part, it's an investigation movie. It's yeah. It's two characters trying to find out what is happening. Yeah, it's a slow burn. Yeah. Um, it's it's a slow burn that leads to something that is worth yeah. sitting through the slow burn for. But I also I also find that slow burn, they they manage and again we've we've mentioned this before um, that mm. if you get your atmosphere right. 
yeah. then you know it, they they manage to get this wonderful tense atmosphere where you you never fully feel comfortable and un, unlike uh, Christine, I do actually like the characters in this. Yeah, movie, me too. so I yeah. care for them. I don't want them to to uh, be killed, especially not in the horrific way that uh, Sadaka is it uh, Sadako yeah. Sadako. Sorry, yeah. Sadako, uh, the way she uh, deals with her victims. Um, yeah. So, it, yeah. There's it, that face that they're left with after they yeah. die. It's just <laughs> horrific. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so, it, it, it's very confident in that, in that respect. You know, it, it doesn't rely... It does rely on... The, there's very little music in this. The only music that mm-hmm. happens is when like a horror scene or something happens and yeah. unfortunately there's a few jump scare moments which mm. are a bit cheap in it uh yeah. like they'll look at a photograph and they'll be Dah! and you're going <laughs> right okay but yeah. i i can i can you know i'll i'll forgive this movie for it because mm-hmm. it does so well at creating the overall atmosphere of uh, of tension that i can't really detract from it i, I don't think it I don't think it's that big of a detractor. Yeah, I think they, they they diligently use music most of the time, or sometimes it's not even music. It's just like that's just a really odd yeah. sound yeah. that is happening constantly for now, and that's unnerving. Because uh, I think there's a there's a problem with a lot of films that they substitute scary music for something scary happening. Yeah, you know, like nothing about like oh, some films you'll be sitting watching it and you'll be like. Nothing scary is happening, but they're playing this creepy music, and it's kind of creeping me out a bit. Yeah. But I'm also very aware that nothing is happening right now. Whereas this film, this film does a lot of just holding on things for a little bit too long while you're yeah. just waiting, and it it creates tension that way. It has a sort of a, I don't want to say a cinema verite, because it isn't like it isn't a fly on the wall thing, but the way it's shot kind of feels that way a little bit it feels it feels very very real real yes you know it feels like because i mean the, the whole thing is couched in this idea that she is a, a reporter yeah she works for a, a tv station i think yeah. they never specifically say that she works for a tv station but uh they what have she cameras doing, so i'm assuming yeah. she yeah what she is doing and the places that she's working on the videotape imply that she's working for some kind of yeah. media corporation at least and she's making a documentary about it seems like she's making a documentary about an urban legend yeah or urban le- urban folklore or something but like the, they the, don't the the very beginning of the movie uh, it has the two schoolgirls who are mm-hmm. who are literally just in a very natural way given the exposition for what this movie's about it's you yeah. know they're going through this urban legend but it's done yeah, very yeah. well you know one of them is very giggly and over the top and mm. doesn't uh doesn't believe in trying to kind of mess with their friend who it yeah. then turns out watch the movie watch this video yeah but and- she's not sure like she still doesn't like it happened but she's still in sort of a a, a headspace where she's like Oh, maybe that was just somebody messing yeah. with us. But yeah, because she initially, like, she goes, it's very, very, very serious, and like, oh, I mm. watched it, and you know, very creepy. And the friends all like, going, oh no, the 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 giggly friends suddenly, her attitude changes, then, yeah. and she's like, oh no, oh no, and 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 they're getting on like this, until Tomaro, I think is her name, the mm. the girl who watched the videotape. Yeah, they call she, her Tomo for short. I think Tomo. Yeah. Uh, she then starts giggling and goes, nah, I'm only messing you until right. the phone rings. And just to go back yeah. to what we were saying about the, the, the lack of music in this mm-hmm. in this movie, it helps so much because when that phone rings, it is so loud and so piercing yeah. that it it just tenses your spine. You're like, ooh. Yeah. And she has just got through saying that like the legend is that you watch this videotape yeah. and then right after you've watched it, the phone rings and then someone on the other end of the phone tells you in seven days you are going to die yeah and like and like then they laugh and they're mucking around and then the phone rings (laughs) and then she gets that look on her face and her friend looks at her and then she's like wait a minute you were serious weren't you because they play it off like she was pretending 
yeah. that it happened to her. And then when the phone rings and she gets this look of deathly fear on her face, her mate looks at her and is like, wait, no, this really happened, didn't it? And she's like, yeah. Ah. And then he picks up the phone and it's her mom. Ah, <laughs> that's fine. Oh, mom. Na, 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 na. And then, <laughs> oh, but the rest of that scene and just like the, the tension just slowly creeps because you get that sort of like she keeps flipping from like being afraid to like not taking it seriously yeah and then taking it very very seriously <laughs> and then you get that sort of oh that just shot of her turning around and be like oh and then it just freezes and you're like <laughs> what what <laughs> and you yeah. don't know what's happened uh yeah they, they do just really good with with that of just like the they, they build tension without um like they don't hammer you with it yeah they don't no, hammer no. their point home it's very it's very subtle when it wants to be and the, then, this movie but, could be described almost entirely with the word subtle yeah everything's done with this again it, and, and i think it shows a a confidence with the material they're working with and mm-hmm. The, the the director's confidence with what he was doing how he was how he was showing yeah. and feeding us information um because then straight away we we uh we meet the the reporter uh rico mm-hmm. who i'm pro- i'm probably butchering all these names as well which is <laughs> but uh I, she 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 is rico and her husband i think is ryuji i think is his name yeah uh, yeah and uh, her ex-husband, sorry. Yes, yeah. And I, I, I again, I, I, another thing I like is a small detail, which uh, you know, their their ex ex-husband and wife doesn't explain what happened there, and doesn't go the route so many movies go through where this is them they'll patch up things over the course of this yeah. because you know they, they they don't turn it into a frigging a, re- a relationship drama yeah it's you just know. they happen to be divorced that's it but they're still they 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 get it get on all right you know they still yeah, they get on okay he's a yeah. bit um he's a bit antisocial in, yeah. in in some ways like and they do this they do sort of the thing i think it, it's cribbing in this aspect i think it cribs directly from the shining yeah. Where he and his son both have like the gift. Yeah. <laughs> much like in The Shining, where oh, the Shining shared universe. A... Ooh, Capitalize maybe, maybe. on this. <laughs> crossover. No, thanks. There's oh, too God. much there is too much crossover with the, the ring shining already. Ring. I don't want to talk about the the crossover stuff with the ring that has happened no. in recent years. I no, I do not approve. <laughs> but um yeah, they do sort of a like Danny Torrance. And Jack Torrance in The Shining. Yeah. You know, like, Danny Torrance has psychic abilities. And Jack, his father, has those abilities as well. But they were sort of beaten out of him. Yeah. In his youth. Uh, to the point where he doesn't believe that he has them anymore. And that's why he's affected by the hotel the way he yeah. is and stuff. They do that in this where her kid, their kid, sorry, uh, Yoichi, has that same ability. He is much like you were talking about with Christine or we were talking about like these objects in general uh, and Stephen King, like people being drawn towards them. Yeah. Her kid, because of his weird psychic abilities, he is drawn towards the tape. Yeah. And in fact, we learn about uh, how the, the, the ghost that inhabits the tape and how the whole psychic thing is related to them. Yeah, and their mother and that whole thing with their history and like their sort of mother daughter relationship, uh, with the inherited psychic ability, much like uh, Ryuji and Yoichi, yeah, like father and son, the inherited ability, and I think they imply that maybe uh, Ryuji has trouble socially because of it. Yeah. Uh, oh no, that he's very not much good so. With yeah. Yeah. But I, and again. We'll just go back to that word subtle. They do it, and yeah, you know, a lot of what we're saying here is almost like an interpretation. But it, it's it, implied, yeah, yeah. Like, like he gets frustrated when he talks about it, and you get a lot just from that. Yeah, that he doesn't really. He mentions it obliquely, and then gets kind of flustered. Yeah, and you can tell that she knows what he's talking about, and doesn't also doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, 
but they have to sort of acknowledge it a little bit. Uh, and I, and I also have to say later. that I, I appreciate the because it's a it, it's a certain gripe that I have, and maybe not everyone has it, and maybe it's something that you know it's just it's it's more more just a personal thing. But uh, generally, I kind of can't stand kid actors. But yeah. the kid on again generalizing, but mm-hmm. for the most part. Uh, especially in Western things, uh, they always seem like badly written as well. Where it's it's they're written like adults, yeah. But, they're written like short adults. Yeah, and like the kid would never say the things that exactly. this kid is saying in this film. Yeah, but uh, the, their kid seems to me, and again, you know, someone who is uh, a native speaker might go, "You're completely wrong. <laughs> you know, mm. He's terrible." But he comes across as a kid. It seems, you know, he's got a wee bit of a uh, kind of dark uh, side to him, you know. But again, that's explained with the gift that he the, that he has that this kind of the the shining, <laughs> essentially, you know. So he has a, a bit of that to him, but yeah. uh, for the most part, and it, it makes you kind of care for the kid more because it always kind of takes me out of it. If the kid is sitting there talking to his mother, like, "Oh, don't worry, mother. It's you seem very <laughs> depressed." I'll do your tax returns for you. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah. And it, it, the American remake of this movie, it's not as egregious as a lot of movies, but I remember yeah. the kid in that having a, th- this kind of effect on me, where I, I didn't, I didn't appreciate, it, didn't think it was as well done as, as in this. Yeah, this kid. I think they they they, they make you like this kid a lot because he's kind of like he's weirdly like self reliant in a lot of ways. But it feels like oh, he's he a has to kid. be. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, his ma's at work. Like she's going to work. She's she's doing her best. Yeah. Uh, as a single mother in Japan, but he is going to school on his own. And like I don't know what age he's. He seems like he's about six or seven or something. Yeah. And he's going out to he's going out to school with his backpack and as we. Like, I don't know, it's a wee lunchbox, or maybe he's got, like, a flute in that wee hard case or something, I don't know. But you're like, you just see him going off to school, and you're like, aww, <laughs> poor wee bugger, you know? And he's, like, he's out there on his own, and, like, he's coming home. And, like, there's that weird moment, like, because when I was, re- I hadn't seen this film in a long time, so uh, I didn't remember about the fact that, I remember that Ryuchi was uh, her ex-husband. Yeah. But in, I was like, but is he not the kid's dad then? I don't know. But they have this moment and then maybe later, I'm thinking later on, thinking about it. And I think there's a moment where they encounter each other the first time you see him. Yes, yeah. He has come to see her because she's asked him because she's like got a hold and she's watched this tape at yep. this point. And she's asked him to come around and check it out because she's a little bit unnerved. Um, and she wants him to take a look at it. He's like a university professor. I think he's a physics professor or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but so he comes around and he runs into Yoichi outside, and they have this moment where they just sort of stand and look at each other and don't say anything, <laughs> and then they just walk away. And like thinking about it later, I was like, because when I watched that, initially, I was like, oh, was he not this kid's dad? Does he not really know this kid? Yeah. And then I realized. They just had them. They were probably speaking to each other in their heads. Yeah. At that moment, because they're both like psychic, but they don't hit you in the face with that. That's something that, like, I. It took me, like, after the film was over and me thinking about, that was really weird the way they made them, like, not speak to each other. And then I suddenly realized, oh no, Duh. they were actually communicating. It's just that we couldn't hear it because, yeah. of course, we couldn't. Uh, and they don't like do something clumsy like slap narration over it or anything <laughs> yeah. like that which is nice uh, but it, they just, and, and they again especially at, it out. At, at that stage in in the movie you don't know that anyone has these abilities yeah at all to yeah. notice yeah they haven't introduced that concept at all no. and they don't for they don't and even whenever they're talking about it um you don't really get it until yeah. later, until until it's sort of implied that um, Sadako had these abilities, yeah. Then you sort of retroactively sort of say, "Oh, that's maybe what they were talking about earlier in the film." Yeah, 
in relation to Ryuchi and how bad he is with people and how he has difficulty uh socially you're like oh right and then and then he straight up does say to um uh sadako's well father i guess yeah, uh, yeah. well yeah <laughs> that that he has those abilities because like they're they're talking about they're talking about his wife sadako's yeah. mother and he says that he has those abilities as well and that's the point where it it first becomes like really like brazen about like oh no he's he's like he's a psychic man yeah he has he has spooky powers in his brain <laughs> um and then you can go back from then and be like oh right okay so maybe earlier on when they were talking about him being weird and yeah. him not being good with people and him having his life being somehow experience being somehow different from other people that's what they meant and, and it's then always, maybe it, yeah it's it's always refreshing to to when a movie has has things like this, where it's not, it's not beating your head round with the the information and things like that, where you're coming away from the film still thinking about it and making these connections and and realizing yeah. like it's not it's not holding your hand through it, Go, you know, turning around every couple of minutes. Go, do you, do you understand what's happening? It's, yeah. it's very much goes. This is what's happening. If you can't follow this, then you're sorry. You're going to be left behind. Yeah, that's a problem with a lot of like popular. I uh, don't want to maybe paint with a broad brush here, but a lot of Western <laughs> cinema, yeah, does hit you over the head with exposition, just in case. Like they'll do something to imply something, and then you'll work it out. You'll be like, oh, yeah. and then twenty seconds later, someone will stand there in the middle of the frame and just <laughs> say it out loud. And you're like, it, it may not be yeah. that exactly, but it might as well be. They might as yeah. well just stop the movie. It, it's like if you go to the theatre and you have the person given the soliloquy, you know, they might as well have <laughs> that happen. And to yeah. all the characters yeah. freeze. <laughs> Let's let the audience in on everything that's happened up to this point right in front of them. Yeah. Just in case there's somebody out there that doesn't get it yet. <laughs> yeah. So they, they do that, again, subtlety is the name of the game yep. with this movie of just let's not shove it in people's faces. Now, there is one very, 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 very unsubtle moment in this movie, <laughs> and it is maybe my favorite part of the film, yeah. uh, ironically, <laughs> um, considering what we were talking about earlier, about like, uh, when we were talking about Christine and the visual effects, yeah, and what would happen if this was made today and in this particular scenario we yeah. do have that example <laughs> we have a remake of this film that was made by an american studio uh directed by i think gore verbinski i think directed uh the uh the american remake of this movie and they do at the point where they really really shouldn't at the point that for me defined this film yeah <laughs> they instead of using a practical effect they use a cg effect and it is so obvious like most cg it yeah. is very obvious that it is not real whereas i think one of the things that defined this film for me was how completely believable mm -hmm. the one real practical effect in this movie is to the point where it might be the greatest practical effect i have ever seen Ooh. and i don't mean like it's not spectacular it does it's not some in your face wow it's just i'm i'm looking at this thing that is impossible yeah. and it looks real yeah it looks like it's actually happening it looks frightening it looks genuine yeah. it it yeah. fits the mm -hmm. the entire rest of the movie it, it yeah yeah, it, and I mean that's that's a, essentially what you're saying. You know, a great special effect should do just that. It shouldn't yeah, be it, this like, you know, try and try and show as much as you can. No, it should still yeah. just fit into what the what the story is telling. And yeah, it, it, it should does be believable. Well. It should be believable. It should look like it's actually happening, unless it's something that you want to specifically look like isn't real. Yeah. Um. Like something like if you watch, say, an Avengers movie, <laughs> and you're watching all these, f you're at, at some point in that in the Avengers movies, there is always a point where you're essentially you may as well be watching a cartoon, yeah, because you're just seeing a bunch of CG things hitting other CG things, and 
you can sort of suspend your disbelief up to a point, but at the same time, you are <laughs> just kind of like, this is kind of... I, I'm getting what they're communicating, but I am also not necessarily believing what I'm seeing. Whereas in Ringu, the one time that they lean on an effect, it is just... This could happen. Now, of course, it couldn't happen. It's insane. <laughs> but when you see this practical effect happen in front of you, and it looks like... I mean, there it is 100% practical effect. I mean, this is 1998. And, and it's... 1998, it's, the, it's, it's a low-budget movie. Yeah. It, they are not... They are not... They are not using digital effects. I don't know how they did it. And to be honest, I don't want to know. I did not... I deliberately have never looked up no. how this effect was done. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't want up, to ruin but... the magic. I don't want to ruin the magic. It is... I'm serious when I say this is like maybe my favorite practical effect in a film oh. ever. And I don't want to know how it's done because every time I see it, it shocks me. Yeah. <laughs> every time I see it, I think that's really happening. And it just gets me in my chest when I it's... see the moment, the moment when it goes from being one thing to just seamlessly transitioning into another in a way that should be impossible. It's yeah. just, it just, it just tugs at something inside me. And I've seen this film. I've seen this film maybe about four or five times, I think, since since it came out. Yeah. And every single time I'm waiting for that scene <laughs> and being like, I'm probably going to see it this time and be like, you know what? It's not that good. And every single time I have just been like, no, that looks amazing. And it's such that a, but because the, the, the uh, it happens right at the very end. So mm. you, it, it's such a great payoff for everything we've been yes. saying before to know, uh, like even even when when uh, Rico and uh, I forget her husband's name now uh, Ryuji. Yep, <laughs> when they're when they're investigating the tapes and they're they start like looking at the tape and picking out different pieces of it to try and make sense of it because they, they they essentially are still quite skeptical about yeah. it and almost treat it like it's some kind of killer's calling card or some some kind of thing that can be explained that it's not this supernatural thing yeah. um but uh you know it, it it all pays off because you've got this investigation that they find what island and what hotel is it uh the, yeah it's like a guest house yeah i think the, yeah, it's a wee guest house that they've turned their their house is now yeah i think um the, the the where they used to live is now a guest house on this wee island yeah but uh it it's so well done and like at no point uh for me anyway did i feel comfortable in that sense I always always kind of felt a bit oh things aren't right especially when they go to that island and you're seeing the room that uh the 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 mother in the the videotape uh you see the room where she's combing her hair and stuff, and you're like, "Oh, mm -hmm. I don't like this for some yeah, reason." Suddenly, suddenly, you see the thing that you saw that was—it's really unnerving. The content yeah. of the videotape is unnerving and not overdone either. It's just—it's no. very like it could almost be, you know, like a a film student's art project. But yeah, there's a level of creepiness to it that just yeah. makes it that that added wee bit. Oh. Yeah. No, I don't like this. Yeah, it's the point I think where you you see all these weird images and you see the, her brushing her hair and the weird like the the mirror moving on the wall to yeah. show you the girl standing behind her and then back again. Yeah. And then you get the stupid moving text, which looks a bit silly, but then you're <laughs> like, whatever, because the next thing you see is all these like people, this grainy footage of all these people crawling across the ground. Yeah and moaning and then you just get this static shot of the well and you're staring yeah. at that well and you're like well what's gonna happen now and then just and then it holds on that well for just a little bit too long and then cuts yeah and then they do some stuff later where each, the each next time, time yeah, each, each time she's watching it mm -hmm. and you start to see something's coming out of the well yeah and like yeah the further along it is like the closer it is to that seven day deadline <laughs> the the closer whatever the fuck it is that's gonna come out of the well seems to be rising up and you can never really make it out 
uh, during that point because the footage is deliberately because it's so grainy and like it looks like a really crappy camcorder. Yeah, but I, like, the, also yeah, that degraded. that helps so much as well as mm. because of the medium VHS is very very grainy and very bad. And yeah, you, you it's prone can't... to degradation. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't stand the test of time so very you, well. So you can't make out essentially. It, it could have just been you know some of the noise on the screen. Or mm-hmm. was it a hand? Like, and then, as you say, like each time she goes to it, it'll show a bit more. So you go, no, there's, yep, there's definitely something. Uh, let's burn yep. this tape and yep. let's all forget about it. Will that work? Do you think? <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. But, you know, <laughs> no, it's better than what they do. Let's just put it like that. Yeah. Um, whether or not they actually really solve the problem by the end of this movie, it's, oh, they uh, don't. They I certainly did, do I, not. I no. wholeheartedly think that they make it worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm, yeah, do yeah. You know, I it, mean, it is something that it gets addressed. And uh, now there were there are a few sequels I've seen. I've seen The Ring too, uh, which the sequel is by the same director. Um, and also, there's there's a prequel that I quite liked. It's not necessarily well liked. Um, yeah. There's a prequel called Ring Zero, that <laughs> again, uh, it's they don't necessarily carry the tone of this movie very well in it um they it's mo- it it looks like it's silly to say this but it seems like more of a movie than this <laughs> uh you know this this feels very scrappy and um raw i think yeah. whereas uh, ring zero felt like it had a budget uh, which i think works against it a little bit but again <laughs> ring zero ring zero also has one particular scene that i find horrifying um that is really really good and it is sort of a slow burn but doesn't do nearly as well but they try and explain some stuff about the tape yeah uh, a bit too much again just like like. what i said about christine some things Mm. are left better unsaid or unexplored yeah yeah they try to do some stuff with like energy transference and blah 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 (laughs) in the second one especially where i'm just like this this is not right this was not needed no Uh, but i find that with a lot of films i find that you don't need sequels. Sequels no. generally, I find to be unnecessary, um, especially when they're just cash grabs. I mean, if you have yeah. something that is, say, here's a three part story or a two part story, yeah, then maybe fair enough. But uh, and you know, there was uh, a second book of right. the okay. Ring, but it's not the one that they they did not base the movie off it. In fact, I found out a weird thing: they released two films in the same year. Uh, one which was Ringu, and they released yeah. an adaptation of the second book yeah. in the same year, made this... by the I think the author himself. Was did that the movie. Spirals? Or... Yeah, it's called Spiral. Yeah. It's not. There's another film called Uzumaki, which is Spiral, which is a different film. Yeah. Uh, uh, which I have yet to see, but I am fascinated by, and I really, really, really want yeah. to see. Uh, I only found out you told me about it recently, <laughs> and I I saw the trailer for it, and I was fascinated we'll by. We'll maybe Uzumaki. check it out soon. <laughs> Maybe, maybe if if uh, if something relevant threatens to destroy us, then yes, we certainly will. Um, but it's not that; um, it's a different film because uh, I think the the theme with that is like one's called it's called Ring Spiral and Loop. I think is the name of the, each one in the trilogy. Yeah. Uh, so they're all about like circles. You, you, I guess you haven't the read theme. the books that uh, Ringu's based on, have you? No, I haven't, and I would wonder. I would wonder about how well the translation would be because it was a Japanese mm, yeah. novel. Um, well, I, I, I mean, have read it, translated even, even books despite before. that, from from what I hear, there's there's a lot more kind of uh, from what I read anyway. The, I haven't read the books, but I was hmm. kind of researching them a wee bit. Um, there's a lot more kind of science fictiony type stuff. Yeah, that the director kind of took out and wanted to make it more more of like a, a classic ghost story yeah yeah the, i think he's he leans more heavily on folklore yeah uh, in this than that like ring two gets into that stuff a little bit which <laughs> i think which you know is what i didn't like about ring two yeah um so i think it's good that they lean more and i'm i'm a fan of i like ghosts and monsters yeah i don't necessarily like and i do like science fiction horror as well i am a fan of that but um when you try to, and 
sometimes it's fun to try and explain a ghost yeah. scientifically you know that can be good but it can so easily just cheapen the thing yeah or make it way less frightening again I, I think it's it all... just energy yeah I, I think it again it it's exactly what we said earlier where once something is over explained or you mm. find out the cause of something it becomes less scary the the unknown is more frightening and i, yeah. I have nothing against people trying to blend these genres and I, I would encourage it in fact you know because sometimes you can get wonderful things out of trying to you know mix with the genres trying to subvert them as well you know so like no one should ever be discouraged but sometimes and maybe for the most part it doesn't work that well <laughs> no no i think it's it's usually someone's taking an idea and then that was a good idea and being like well that was a complete thing yeah. that was did for this one story, this one movie, and now we want a sequel. Yeah. So we now need to find some more depth to this thing. And sometimes that is, well, why don't we have people who research it and over ex- and explain <laughs> more about it? Yeah. And usually, but that especially just like to... I, you know, it 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 makes very little sense making a sequel for this movie or the, or mm-hmm. this interpretation of that book as well because this movie is a good 90% if not more is them investigating what's happening so they yeah they uncover what the images in the tape mean they uncover how it was caused or at least who caused it or kind of what entity the stuff that they leave a mystery is better left like that the yeah. you know it's better just not knowing kind of how this was caused or how did she transfer her energy or her essence to this yeah. video tape. You know, I don't care about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it works in the folklore of, you know, I made a copy of the tape and showed it to someone else and now it's their problem. Yeah. That's as much as I need. Yeah. I don't need to be like, well, what's the science of that? Cause it, Why it, it, does that work? And it's like, no... I don't care. I don't care why that works. All I need to know is that that that's the thing. Yeah. And if you don't do that, you're screwed. You yeah. Know? So like, I can accept that. It, it essentially becomes a virus at that point, and it, and it's so yeah. good. It it kind of subverts that uh, <clears throat> a lot a lot of the ideas of uh, you know how to deal with a ghost and and things like that is like if you mm. find the the bones and give it a proper burial, and that that's yeah. kind of been yeah, done. Quite they a lot. do that, yeah. They they actually that that's their thing. That's yeah. their theoretical solution in and, that film. Is we and need that's to reasonable. go and find that her. That seems yeah. like a good idea as well. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it doesn't pay off, unfortunately. Um, no, no. Also, really. I also should say I love that they. It shows you them. They find the well, and it shows you this laborious like all day affair of trying yeah, to get the water really, out. they really 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 break themselves trying to yeah. achieve this goal because i couldn't really remember the remake that well but mm. my wife had seen the remake she hadn't seen this and she had mentioned that in the remake apparently they just find the well and that's it you know that's that. okay. no water in it everything's done for them kind of thing yeah. it's like i remember i i it. yeah i saw the remake in the cinema um and didn't haven't watched it again since no. but i saw it when it came out because i had nothing else to do that day <laughs> in fact was the reason <laughs> i went to see it um and i remember being pleasantly surprised that they didn't completely wreck it yeah um, it's competent. But, it is competent, but it it yeah. it is not a patch to to the original. I don't think. No, no. And like this director, I don't think this director's really ever struck quite as well as he did with this. Now he did do. There's one other film that he did do that I really like. I really like Dark Water, uh, right. which is another movie that involves oh a a, a, a little girl ghost. <laughs> a little They're girl creepy. Ghost. Little girl ghosts are creepy. <laughs> yeah, and like it's a common trope in. Um, Japanese folklore as well, which I think he's cribbing heavily from, of uh, sort of a, a a woman dressed in white with long, very black hair. Yeah, is a thing that you see in a lot of uh, fiction. Uh, a lot of like old ghost stories in Japan tend to be. I mean, The Grudge does that yeah. as well, which is another very good Japanese yeah. horror movie that gets slapped into the same genre as this, the genre of J-horror, which, again, I think is very reductive. 
it, uh, it is it is very yeah. the, the only good thing is it, it did kind of highlight at the time how you know a lot of asian cinema because not just japan but korea yeah. um is, is very good as as well uh for for these kind of for, for movies in general and it kind yeah. of it highlighted this and a lot of people like ourselves because we were we were in like 15 16 when this came out and it made us a bit more aware of you know this is maybe what we were looking for yeah. in horror movies that we weren't getting over here yeah the success of ring of ringu in the west made it easier for me to get a copy of the grudge yeah you know and things like that uh, or like battle royale stuff yes, like that yeah. that maybe wouldn't have come over before uh, there was a was it Tartan Asia Extreme I think was the company that yeah. um, released a lot of those uh, in uh, the West, and I think <clears throat> a lot of that is down to the sort of cult sort of popularity of Ring of yeah. Ringu uh, is that that got big, and then they were like, oh right, well they had all obviously in the West they've been selling a lot of animated stuff like anime um, yeah through like the manga imprint um which i saw a lot of as well around this time or before this <laughs> i saw a lot of that stuff like giver and Pat <laughs> right. and, like, oh, yeah all that stuff <laughs> and um like something like akira from the 80s you know was like it, whenever it came out it, it had a big impact and yeah it, then people started watching all that and i think then when same, a similar thing happened with ringu where suddenly it was oh no these movies now from and again from a sort of painting with a broad brush westerner westerner <laughs> sort of perspective it's all these uh asian movies you know <laughs> yeah. specifically it's a japanese movie but i think as a result of that a lot of other movies have eventually come over from asia yeah. like you were saying uh south korea in particular um yeah. there has been like i mean parasite uh parasite. Won best picture oh, at the Oscars. Boy is one of my yep. favorite movies of all time I yeah mean, excellent yeah uh, i, I might Chan not Wook. have seen it and, well you know we were always interested in and, and other things we've been watching yeah i've been watching weird movies from all over the world <laughs> yeah. from i was like 12 you know yeah but <laughs> um yeah it's but getting it, a hold it, of them was always difficult how, sorry uh it, it highlights just how absurd the the term world cinema is in a lot yeah. of these award ceremonies that like american cinema is classed as its own thing and then yeah. everything else is world cinema. Yeah, it's like where they have like the. Uh, it's almost patronizing the way they have uh, best foreign language film. Yeah, and you're like, because there was that there was that famous thing whenever Parasite won uh, the Oscar, it won two, didn't it? It won uh, best picture and best foreign yeah. film. And there was that crazy racist redneck guy. <laughs> who like had no views on his youtube channel and then he did this crazy rant about the fact that parasite won two award had these two awards and it was allowed to be up for these two separate awards very well deserved and, as well yeah absolutely 100 percent. yes now he was trying to make the point that uh it shouldn't have been allowed to be in best foreign language film and best picture <laughs> but he did it in this his 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 motivation seemed to be just angry, xenophobic, racist bigot. What a surprise. Whereas, unfortunately, the end result of the thing that he wanted would have basically been, okay, so it doesn't get nominated in Best Foreign Language Film. We get rid of that category. <laughs> but now what we do is we end up with a bunch of foreign language films in your precious Best Picture category. Yep. Because that film, 100%, was the best film that came out that year. Yeah. I think. And very no rarely does it, does it happen that it... That it yeah. That something like that wins that as well yeah, the <laughs> idea that a foreign language film would win best picture is unfortunately statistically speaking yeah. a slim to nil margin of likelihood so but i, I do uh, th I, I think that uh i mean we're getting off topic of like the actual content of ringu but yes i think it does deserve it, it being mentioned yeah. because it helped it, it helped to normalize i kind of hate saying that but help normalize uh Asian <laughs> movies. I hate everything I'm saying in this sentence. You know, yeah. but but it helped make it le legitimize, I suppose, yeah. in it the eyes this, of the general public. Yeah, it got this reputation, uh, sort of uh, as being this, oh, this film that's so frightening and it's this amazing film, and it got a really great reputation that made people want to see it. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, like, subtitles are unfortunately a barrier for a lot of people and for mainstream success, yeah. usually. Um, and I think that uh, Ringuna, I don't think it hit cinemas in the West. I don't know if, I don't think can't, it did. I don't think it did either. I, I, I only can't ever, remember. Yeah, can't I remember only that ever far saw back. It. That's, that's another yeah. lifetime ago. By the time I was seeing it, I was seeing it on a VHS in like 1999 yeah. or 2000 or something like that. And um, <laughs> that was the way that happened. But then other, after that, you started to see subtitled movies showing up in yeah. cinemas here and there. And So I think this film had a huge impact in that regard. It really made a difference. And I think deservedly so. I think uh, it would have been nice for them to not have to try and break that barrier. But this film did it it's the it, world we live in it's yeah, yeah you yeah. know it it yeah. worked for uh it worked out in in our favor actually cause... indeed yeah because we got to see all these great films because <laughs> yeah, yeah I, again like at that point like because ringu becomes popular i can walk into say i'm going back through the sands of time here <laughs> but into virgin megastore back in the day when those existed and go to the the horror section and see a bunch of japanese movies in there and a few yeah. chinese movies as well and you started to see though that stuff being easily purchasable by someone like me it used to be that you'd have to go and like import things yeah. and, and you still kind of do for some things you still kind of do then then you would have to worry if your dvd player could play those as yeah. well uh, because of the regions you know, like and region one region two region yeah. three and it like, was oh convenience was uh, the, yeah, yeah. It was, it was not the name of the game back then yeah. so it was really cool for me to just be able to go down to then virgin megastore and be like well there's ju on the grudge now yeah. that probably wouldn't have been here if the ring hadn't made this leap over and now i can watch that you know and the whole host of other films and like again like battle royale coming over again tartan asia extreme did a lot of stuff where they imported a lot of films they brought films over to the west yeah and they battle royale was one of the ones that i saw because i remember they had the same sort of logo treatment on the boxes like a copy of the ring had and yeah. our copy of john had it was all that so i sort of i i grouped them all together even though genre wise they are very different and oh like, yes yeah and very john john's a very different film and like stylistically it and the ring are very different uh i mean they have ultimately a long-haired pale <laughs> lady ghost oh so it's the and, same film and it is they are sort of yeah and they are sort of about uh revenge yeah. um vent indiscriminate revenge as well they share the, but um, i can't remember that because it, it's it's an actual particular japanese ghost name for that that mm. type of ghost and i my mind's going blank right now but uh mm. And I know that there is there's an actual name for that type the, of like, it's, revenge. It's, it's a it's a folkloric thing. Yeah. It's an established thing in Japanese uh, folklore of just uh like in in Juon, it's well you came into this house yeah so now no matter how far you, you run idiot. <laughs> yeah no matter how far you go you're stuffed um and if with uh with Ringu it's you watch this tape yeah and now that's it you have seven days. Oh, uh, you're done now. At least there's a get out in Ringu that doesn't exist in The Grudge, really. Yeah. Whereas, like, The Grudge is just you're scuppered at, at no matter what. You can't get away from that. <laughs> Whereas in uh, in Ringu, there is a sort of a... There's not an option to defeat it, but there's an option to deflect its attention, maybe. <laughs> to there's an option another... to, to basically do what uh, the the main character in thinner does and just make it someone else's problem which is Ugh, and, and this Stephen is even Painter. worse because <laughs> the way you deal with this is you make a copy of the tape mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then she'll like go okay right now you're safe or you make a copy and you get someone else to watch it yeah so. you have to get somebody else yeah. to watch your copy that you made yeah. so that means someone else gets it so it, it's it's like a an, like an std almost <laughs> But, well, no. I suppose you don't get rid of the STD by giving something. No, you don't. Yeah, you don't. You pass it on, but you don't pass it on. You, yeah. yeah, you just you just 
you infect you know someone you know else. You don't cure analogy. yourself. It, it was a really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'll just start from the beginning. It's like a cursed videotape that you copy and get someone else to watch to get <laughs> ear cursed. Wow, that's a really good metaphor, John. I would have never thought of it in those terms before. Yeah. Wow. So it's like a cursed videotape that you copy and give to someone. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well. <laughs> I'm uh, bad at analogies. <laughs> no, clearly. Uh, <laughs> right. So, yeah, the ring. So, I think I think it's safe to say that uh, we both really like Ringu. Yeah. 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 I think it's a great film. All right. So these things are about to sort of uh, feel like they're they're going to get through this door pretty soon. So we better move on to our third movie. Uh, our third movie being Ivan Reitman's Ghostbusters. Two, the second Ghostbusters movie. Um, so, uh, John, I, I, I happen to think that uh, Ghostbusters, the first Ghostbusters movie, is one of the best films I have ever seen. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite. Is one of my favorite films. It's, it's one of those. It's in my top five. I yeah. think. Um. So, John, what did you think of Ghostbusters Two? Well, much like yourself, I do love the first Ghostbusters, and I don't know how much that is just the the horrible grip of nostalgia <laughs> uh, warping my fragile mind. But uh, I don't mind. I, I I like Ghostbusters too. It's yeah. it's not a patch on the sequel or on the sequel on the original. No, but uh, I I still think it, it gets a hard time. Maybe yeah, not think, so much now because we've seen what a really bad Ghostbusters movie can be. Yeah, but I know a lot of people who who disregard it and think it's it's complete trash. But mm. I I enjoy it. It's it's a fun yeah. movie. It's essentially, you know, it's it's still a comedy. It's still mm-hmm. I, I do I do think it was neutered slightly. I read somewhere that. Uh, because of the popularity, and I, I know as a Ghostbusters fan, you watched the cartoon series as well. I did indeed, um, obsessively. I yeah. would say I watched so that cartoon. We might be to blame because our little baby minds, uh, who watched the cartoon series, they tried to make this movie more in line with that. So they mm. stepped away because the first one has some pretty scary parts, and it, it's got. A lot of uh, adult innuendo type it things. Does. I mean, at one point, Ray has sex with a succubus. Yeah, or something. Actually, yeah. that's something in the first one. I'm not sure, like, whether that's happening because it's in a dream. And it, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want my reading of that now is that he's just having a weird sex dream about a ghost, <laughs> and that it's maybe not actually happening. Right, because there's no indication in the real world that it's happening. All that happens in the real world is he's moaning about in his bed, and then eventually he falls out of bed. Yeah, and that's it. Like all the ghostly stuff is happening in what seems like in his dream. So I don't know. Okay. But either way, adult themes most certainly. Yeah. In the first Ghostbusters movie, so, no question. So this one's a little bit more child friendly. I would. I would. Yeah, say. in the modern parlance, I'd say it's more PG thirteen. Yeah, uh, like or uh, sorry, uh, to go with a European or uh, UK standard, twelve A, than yeah. it is fifteen or eighteen. But I, uh, I, I don't think, think, especially the start, because I, I, they, they kind of I mean at the very start, or no, well, not the very start. The very starts the the baby stroller uh, hits that pink goop stuff and goes yeah. off and and. Uh, Sigourney Weaver's character Dan is chasing and, and all this uh, so it, it gets straight into it straight into Aye. kind of what's going on here uh, but the very first Ghostbusters you see are Ray and Winston oh my. and it's so cringy but it's oh. me- it's meant to be they go to this yeah. kids uh, birthday party and the kids yeah. are not impressed they wanted no. He-Man they keep cheering for He-Man and it's yeah. oh it's awful and so it's... you have these like slightly overweight you know uh, middle class <laughs> guys turning up in their Ghostbusters 
uh, costumes. Anyone else would be... Do, do you know if we were kids and that happened? I assume you meant middle-aged and not middle-class there. <laughs> or sorry, very middle-aged. Much... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's middle-class gentleman. Yeah, oh. mm. <laughs> yes. Hello, did you want middle-class gentleman for your child's birthday party? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but like they're 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 paunchy and they're like clearly like a little fed up and they're uh, slightly desperate, but not so desperate that they are going to continue the ruse because they do just give up <laughs> somewhat into that scene. They're just like stuff this. I'm going to have a beer. They even start dancing to the theme tune, and it <laughs> yeah. it's awful. It is terrible, but it again... almost feels like a commentary on what they're doing with this film. <laughs> yes, in a way, yeah. to me, it's like. We didn't necessarily want to come back for this. Yeah. Um, or we feel like we are rehashing Certainly Bill something. Murray didn't. Yeah. Uh, we feel like we're. It's almost like we are rehashing something we did five years ago. Yeah. And still, like, we're still talking about this thing we did five years ago that maybe we should have moved past by now, but we haven't. And, and I mean, here a lot we of the... are again because we need money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they needed money or it was just the the studio were really pushing for a sequel because of the success mm. of uh, Ghostbusters 1. But again, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. There There is an, an element of... Uh, it, it is quite self-aware of what it is. Yeah. It is a cash grab in a, mm. in a lot of ways. But, yeah, uh, and they even like... They, they do some... I mean, they did it in the first one as well in the commercials and stuff, but they have like the Ghostbusters like merchandise <laughs> yeah. is on display in the film in a way but that's kind of like, like the maybe one. them commenting on it where they're <laughs> like this got way out of hand the but toys on... and the, the mug like I had that mug there's a literal <laughs> mug in it that like changes colour when you put hot water in it that's and right, I had yeah. that mug it was like uh, when you put something hot in it it would be Slimer and then you would pour the water in and it would turn into the Ghostbusters logo. <laughs> and I used to just, whenever I had that mug, I did not drink hot drinks then. But I would just boil the kettle and pour water into it just to see it change and go back. <laughs> and, it, and, and that's the difference. In the first one, the first one could have bombed. They didn't know. Uh, the, mm-hmm. there, there's actually a very good uh, series on Netflix called Mo- Movies That Made Us. And uh, uh, yes, one of them yes. is Ghostbusters. It, it's a it's a really good watch. Like the amount of problems, like, and the amount of things that c- should have stopped that movie from ever mm-hmm. being what it is or ever coming out at all. But it uh, it just leads me to to think, you know, a lot of that stuff that they put in the first one uh, with the merchandise, yeah. they didn't know it was going to be such a big hit, and you were going to get merchandise. And yeah, we had the. You know, there was the toys. There was the. I had so much Ghostbusters stuff, like, and it was all like, I never got any of it new. I think I got a lot of like secondhand Ghostbusters stuff off yeah. like other kids who were like selling their old toys down the street and stuff for like forty p and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, got I was a lot very of much Venk- the same. different. I got a lot of different versions of Peter Venkman that when you squeezed his arm, his eyes popped out. That was like a really common uh, trope with the Venkman toys. Yeah, that that uh, kind of feeds in. You know, the 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 cartoon series was was, was different from from the movies uh, yeah. a lot, but they kind of did get the general characters kind of right. You know, Peter's yeah. the one who he's just trying to make money. Really, he's he's a con yeah. man essentially. Yeah. From the beginning of, in fact, in this movie, he even admits to being a fraud. <laughs> yeah, in yeah, the first scene that we see him in. Like he's just like where well, he's got this, and it's it's kind of a perfect thing for the character of Peter Venkman to now be presenting this sort of flim flam, crappy TV show about psychics. Yeah, that like, and uh, the point where he's he's just like. He literally says, I am a fraud. <laughs> like, he will do anything to make money. I mean, that's the whole point. The reason they start the business in the first film in the first place is that Peter sees dollar signs. Yep. That's it. That's his whole... A lot of his character is motivated by, like, we can do this, merchandising. Even in this movie, he makes a comment about when they make... There's a point where they make the toaster dance. And he picks it up and hugs it. And he's like, you're my number one Christmas gift item. We're going to sell a million of these. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's kind of a shame that they didn't rectify the 
what what I feel is one of the major problems of the first one, and that is that Winston Winston's character is just forgot about for he's diminished so much it's... in most of the film even to the point where you're like wait a minute where's winston a lot yeah. of the time uh especially uh when we were watching it this time um my fiance asked me after the courtroom scene yeah where like the, the scalari brothers so yeah the they have like this evil slime they're being tried for basically digging a hole in the middle of first avenue in new york yeah. without any permission then they have this slime and they have all their gear and obviously like the, the the judge is this horrible angry man and him being angry and screaming at them agitates the slime and these yeah. ghosts of he these has no two. peripheral vision whatsoever no, right? he's there just like excuse me your honor your honor uh uh and he's like basically just screaming at them and generates these two ghosts and then they have all the proton packs there so conveniently they fight the ghost now when that scene begins winston is established to be there yeah he's in the courtroom because he comes up them he's not on trial because he wasn't taking part in the digging a hole in the street yeah. thing uh even though it probably would have been handy to have a fourth guy there but he's <laughs> not there i don't know what's what's up with like maybe ernie hudson asked for too much money or something i don't know i don't know I'm just probably something insidious like that. I'm fully speculating. I don't know, but he's there in that scene and he's like, Oh, you're you're stuffed, and then he goes and sits back down. <laughs> and then whenever they're fighting the ghosts, he's just where is he? Yeah. He's just not there. And you're like, But he's a ghost buster too. Yeah. That's not a pun on the name of this movie. <laughs> but he is a ghostbuster as but well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, like, Where's Winston going on through but, most of this and, film. And like, he does get his, his props a bit later, but yeah. he, spends, he spends a lot of the movie not Absent. present. But even even yeah. to the fact that at the very start, you know exactly what the other three are up to. Like, it, it takes time to show you Egon is now uh, a professor. He's yeah. he's back in uh, teaching in universities. Ray has his bookstore. He does. Uh, yeah. Peter has his, his awful TV <laughs> his show. Awful, awful, awful yeah. TV show. But like, who the fuck watches that show? It's terrible. Yeah, you, you get like a little sort of hint of like Winston is at the party. He's doing like the the twelve the the kids' birthday party thing yeah. with Ray, but what else is he up yeah. to like does he have a job does he what's he like, doing it, and like you get nothing because those appearances are very much a side thing it, 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 like they, yeah. they make reference to it and they 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 go on to to say how everyone sued them after the first movie yeah. because of the damage that they did yeah which the city, is another the problem. city screwed them and sued them and everybody sued them and they yeah. didn't get paid <laughs> and like, that, that, that's another uh a thing that I kind of miss from the first one that I I noticed in this one is like the amount of damage they do with those proton packs in the first mm. movie. Oh is yeah, brilliant! Like they completely destroy whatever yeah, they room they're in. In it, that the first <laughs> job that they go yeah. on and they wreck that ballroom and half of it's on fire. Yeah, and like even like Peter Venkman just goes out of his way to break things <laughs> yeah. where he like he tries to do the uh pulling the uh the tablecloth out from under the table and smashes everything on the <laughs> yeah. table and he's just like the flowers are still standing <laughs> like yep but again now we're, we're talking about the first film which is yeah, so difficult it's so difficult not to talk about Ghostbusters when talking about Ghostbusters 2 yeah because it Ghostbusters 2 is 100% informed by the existence of Ghostbusters. I mean, even the fact that the very start of it is five years later. It, it is, yeah. it, it's almost like it's meant to be watched straight after Ghostbusters. Yeah, that, that's the first thing that comes up on the screen yeah. is five years later. It's really weird. Like, I find that jarring. Yeah, because um, it, it you're kind of sitting there going, oh, wait. Did I just miss something, or am I like watching the right five thing? years later than what? Yeah, and then you guess, and then after a, after a wee second, when you're sitting watching, like, I guess they mean five years after the last movie. Yeah, but it came out five years later, so you know that's implied, <laughs> I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 very odd. That's yeah. a very odd choice, I think. But uh, um, yeah, so and, and like just not to not to really labor on the. My, my problems with Winston being largely forgot about. Uh, but I think they really miss an opportunity with him because he is the everyman. Yep. He is the one. 
there's a really good part he has a good moment in it where they go to see the mayor much later on to like mm-hmm. say oh they're big there's big pink slime here Aye. and egon tries to explain it but egon egon cannot... feels horribly <laughs> yeah. because eball e- e- e-ball. e-ball egon egon <laughs> egon is bad with people yeah that is that has been a thing like throughout the entirety like ghostbusters one and this one yeah he's not good with people uh like the horrible experiment that he's doing when we're introduced to him it's it's borderline unethical yeah probably not borderline just no it's sociopathic the (laughs) idea that he's basically just got these people in a in a fake waiting room and he's trying to see how their negative emotions affect the environment by having them wait and wait for marriage counselling. He's deliberately gotten a couple that need marriage counselling and set up a fake marriage counselling appointment that will never come and is just turning up the... He's turning up the heat in the room. And and even what is it? He he says something to Diana or... Or Dana, sorry. Uh, Hmm. He he says something to, to her and instantly turns around with his wee... A motion reader contraption to see. Yeah, <laughs> she asks. Uh, the Peter comes up in conversation. She's oh, like, yes. "Don't tell Peter about this." And then she sort of turns away and says, "Does he ever ask about me?" And then he turns around. He gets this this evil little smile on his face, and he says, "Nope." And then he scans her to <laughs> yeah. see, like you see her visibly get a little bit crestfallen. And then he scans her because he's just <laughs> doing it for the sake of his experiment. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking bastard! Yeah. But, yeah, so um, yeah, so, I mean, so lar- the, largely, I think the characters uh, they, they do a good job of keep, keeping the characters yeah, they're intact, the same. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. There's none of them feel like that doesn't seem like something Ray would do, or that Egon mm. wouldn't respond that way. You know, they seem largely, yeah. as you say, intact. And Winston is there, as you say. He was in the first one. He was the everyman, where it was like they're all like, well, say Bill, like Bill Murray's just plays Venkman so well as just yeah. this weirdo who is he's such a, he is really odd he's yep. such an odd guy but he's really funny and he is motivated by money opportunistic and yeah but he is also a scientist but he's kind of a grifter yep. in in his science and you've got Egon who's 100% just all about scientific discovery and stuff like that and you got ray who's this sort of in the middle kind of guy yeah who's just he's sort of the nervous guy that is also like into science but he's somewhere between the two of them yeah and they introduce winston in the first one to be this every man who every people will be like who will be there to have things explained to him he's yeah. there to ask questions and he's there to also give a perspective an outside perspective from these three guys yeah um like whenever in the first one whenever they are talking about like why is there so much uh spectral activity and he's the guy that says you know he quotes revelations yeah about like you know the dead rising from the grave and it's him that has that sort of thing of maybe this is the end of the world yeah you know and in this one he does he does fill that same role in a way where yeah he's the guy that breaks it down for the mayor and tries to explain it yeah you know he's like put it in real terms of like it's concentrated evil when they try to explain what the slime is yeah that's the thing they're trying to explain to the mayor about the slime <laughs> and like they're all failing miserably and then winston's just like it's all the bad feelings and the nastiness of the people in the city is turning into sludge <laughs> which is a cool concept yeah that's a really cool concept the idea that like people being bitter and angry is forming this sort of fluid that is <laughs> gathering underneath the streets. Which, which is why uh, New York is the perfect setting for it. <laughs> yeah, so they, they do a real good job. That that's At the very beginning of it, they, they go straight in with that with uh, when Dan is like going down the street and everybody's bumping into each other and shouting at each other yeah. and being rude and snarky and like the guy that works in her building is like she asks him to help her with her groceries. He's like, I'm not the door, man. <laughs> you know? And he's like, yeah. And that's what, what all this stuff is happening there. That's what causes the stuff to seep up. Yeah. From the cracks under the street. And like, well, it's, like, it's, it's also the presence. Like it, it's, it's twofold. It's the presence of uh, the Vigo painting. Yeah. Uh, so Vigo is the, the, the villain in this one. He, he's the catalyst for this happening. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
this like New York again, perfect environment for him because <laughs> the negativity of a big city, yeah, um, is creating this sludge. Yeah, it's this physical manifestation of people being like nasty and mean to each other, and they do that stuff. Looks really good. I love the look of the slime. Yeah, all that stuff looks great again. And I guess we're going to just talk about like with all three of these films. I think the special effects are a very important part of all of these films. Yeah. Um. Now, I, I don't think, I think the effects in this movie look very good. And, uh, but again, if I'm going to compare it to the first film, I think the effects in the first film look a lot better. Yeah. In that they're a bit more, hmm, I don't know how to put this. There's some effects in this movie that I look at and I'm like, oof, I don't know. Um, the like sludge they do in the lean. bath is, is a bit... It, hasn't it looks a bit well. weird it looks a bit weird and that there's some sort of some of the ghosts they do lean on a bit of stop motion animation yeah which they didn't really know a lot of the other stuff they do with like puppetry and with um like the way they do like the the proton effects and stuff always look great yeah uh i think the fact that it's all like hand drawn it's like hand drawn animation yeah uh is great and i think i think the first ghostbusters especially still looks good today i think it's oh, I the agree. special effects i think the special effects in that film hold up extremely well i think in this film there's a couple of moments where i'm like "Ooh, i don't know and i don't know whether that's like necessarily the execution or whether it's some of them conceptually i don't know about <laughs> like uh there is a point where janos who Again, I think he steals the show a little bit. He's not in it that much. Screen <laughs> no. time wise, he's not in it much. It's a Peter McNichol, and he does this great, stupid, like deliberately non specific <laughs> yeah. Eastern European accent. <laughs> At one point, Peter even asks him, Where are you from again? Uh, the he's Upper just, East Side. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the, there's a very real possibility that he isn't even foreign. He's just weird. <laughs> yeah, just a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, he's just a weird guy. Um, but there is a point where he shows up dressed like Mary Poppins or a nanny or something. <laughs> and, like, the effect itself is like, oh, yeah, fair enough. You know, it doesn't look terrible. But he has this bit where his arm stretches out. Yeah. And it looks, I think it looks terrible. And it, I think it looks bad. And maybe they shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Maybe they did it because they could. But maybe they should have thought about whether they should. <laughs> I don't know. Because... Outside of that, I think the effects look very good. Uh, there is whenever they're doing like the whole "oh no, all the monsters are happening." They have this sort of stop motion, uh, big huge beast that I don't think looks great. No, no. Um, but when they have all the people coming off the Titanic, it looks a wee bit dodgy. I don't know, but I but conceptually <laughs> that is a great idea of the Titanic yeah. showing up again. Yeah. Um, I always forget if it's in the first one or second one, but. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's definitely a highlight. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just. And I mean, a nice you, you see the seams a lot of the times in the in the Statue of Liberty bit, mm, like you, yeah. you, you know, because it does like close ups of the feet occasionally, and you can kind of see it looks a bit rubbery and stuff like that. But yeah. Again, it's not a massive detractor from it, you know, as far as special effects go, especially. 1989 it looks good for mm. special effects for 1989 yeah. it does yes i think I, I but i think like ghostbusters special effects look good for any era yeah i think like the first the first film especially i think just looks like it could have been made today yeah there's a certain uh, style to it that i think helps it i, I can't mm. i can't pinpoint what it is but it, just what you're saying it, it kind of stands the test of time and i think that's yeah. it, it's not like the well for the most part they haven't really went like photorealistic or anything like that but no it just works with with the the setting and everything but yeah the ghosts have a certain shape to them they don't look they're not like straight up ghosts of people yeah in a way i mean they are supposed to be ghosts of people but they don't look just like transparent people they're all sort of i think there's a lot of puppetry going on and there's a lot of like if not mostly puppetry i don't think any of it's really there's like the people coming off the titanic look like you know regular yeah. just people who are transparent and stuff like that but mostly they're like these strange sort of puppets that have been designed and built and they all have this sort of look that 
you know, you can accept that, you know, ghosts look like that. That's just yeah. what ghosts look like and whatever. Yeah. So you've got that sort of separation of they're from another world. So they're not just going to look like people. You yeah. know, they're going to be these weird, slightly monstrous things. Um, but like, I think this movie, this movie, I think, suffers a little bit from being a sequel to such a good film. Yeah. In that I feel like a comedy sequels in general uh, are, are, are usually bad. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of a, a lot of comedies that the uh, comedy sequels that are worth watching. No, uh, generally they are cash grabs on something that was uh, and successful and they're just trying to do a number two on it, you know? Yeah. And it, it it's that old thing where they, and, and this movie is definitely uh, uh, guilty of this. They, yeah. they rehash a lot of the same jokes and a lot of, I mean, the fact that Slimer is in it, I find yeah. to be ludicrous. Again, uh, again, that that is the fault of the well, not the fault, but that is because the cartoon series mm-hmm. features Slimer as this like companion almost of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah so, he lives in the friggin' fire station with them in the cartoon. Yeah, because he's one of the most memorable things in the first movie. Yeah, uh, but and I guess they felt like because he was this memorable ghost from the first film that they have to like reference that they have to be self-referential. Yeah, and. Like they really, sh- I just don't think that was wise to do. Like you do get that moment, you're like, "Ha, ah, there's Slimer, great!" But <laughs> as someone like me who's seen this movie multiple times, you know that novelty is gone. Yeah, that yeah. does not work on me at all. It is 100 percent a novel thing of "Ha, ah, there's Slimer." They, they'd also planned there was meant to be a lot more of uh, Slimer and uh, Rick Moranis's character, Louis. I think is Lewis, his name yeah. Lewis uh, Lewis Tully yeah. he he they were meant to have like a kind of he was always trying to catch Slimer um so the the brief scene where he sees him in the in He's the fire the station bus. yeah and oh. later on the bus and stuff this was all meant the, the bus was meant to be all like it was all meant to build up to that that scene to know where he's actually driving the bus and he's okay, like so because yeah like like they have this implied relationship between the yeah. two of them in some way it's but like he's it's always trying to catch him and feel it like a tom and jerry type thing you know yeah um where slimer's always outsmarting him but uh i'm not i'm not sure why it never they, they never fully got that or it, they, i mean you know so many of these things you can read about and they're, they just turn out to be rumors but mm. uh maybe maybe that's why you know he, he's featured quite heavily in it yeah i don't know it just it's just i just don't like referential humor no i think as a rule <laughs> yeah. um whenever it's just like this isn't even a joke it's just here's a thing you recognize yeah i don't like that's lazy to it's, me it's and like, very I lazy wanna... and yeah, i mean the, the, the very st- the, the first like the first half of, of ghostbusters 2 is is very good with uh like I, I was genuinely laughing at parts. Like there's the examination of the baby and, and things like yeah. that. You know, where they're being very clinical and like you know. Yeah, you get the feeling like a lot of that's improvised as well. You get yeah. the like Stan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis just like just 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 cribbing. Yeah. We've got all this yeah. stuff. We're just gonna say these dumb things while we're pretending to examine this baby. And uh, yeah, and and and, and a game uh, with uh, uh, Peter. Uh, for some reason, I forgot his name. How did that happen? He's very much uh, cribbing as well. He's very much just mm. going off the cuff, um, and I mean that 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 happened in the first movie as well. They 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 did do a lot of impro- improvisation. Yeah. Um, but they got it, the cast for it. Like I mean, you got would you get those guys together? Just 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 let's just roll the cameras and see what you come off with. Yeah, <laughs> and it works because it one one of my one of the lines I really liked was like uh, Dana brings uh, Ray into the the baby's bedroom she goes oh it's a mess and he goes oh we didn't come in here to play or something but it's it, like i butchered it there but the way he delivers it is so funny <laughs> so yeah like uh it it could have it could have been better definitely because then i think yeah. the latter half of it kind of follows the same structure as the first movie but not mm. doing it as well you know they they fall out of favor with the mayor You've got the antagonistic kind of guy who works with the mayor. 
Yeah, um, you have that sort of thing where they get arrested in the first film and put in jail. Yeah. And they're taken out of jail. In this one, they get put in a mental hospital at the same point in the movie. And yeah. they have to get taken out of the mental hospital in exactly the same way yeah, as it does exact, in the first you know, one. You're just like, those moments are kind of eye rolling because yeah. it's like, oh, come on. I, yeah. I did enjoy that the, when they're getting interviewed in the psych ward, like the everyone apart from Peter is basically telling the truth, and he's just yeah. like, oh, I don't know, these people are crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's like this freaking is it Brian Doyle Murray? That's uh, Bill Murray's brother. Yes, is, that's uh, right. Playing yeah. the the doctor that's interviewing them, and he's just Bill Murray's just like he's just got his head face down on the table <laughs> while they're trying to sensibly explain this rationally, because and he <laughs> just look, he just raises his head and looks at him and goes. I don't know what any of these guys are talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's essentially, you know, it, there's so many movies that you watch and you, uh, that, that'll be about supernatural things or maybe sci-fi things. And you see that where the, the, the characters try to explain to this psychiatric person, you know, try to tell them the truth and like, oh, no, there's ghosts. And, you know, when any half sensible person, even if you witness these things, you go, well, I better lie here because I don't want to be committed. Yeah, because these people will think I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah so it, which, uh, which is the thing that often gets explored in, in movies, in yeah. horror movies especially. Oh, yeah. Uh, where it's like, oh, no, nothing happened because that person, like, you could be watching a movie and be like, why don't you just tell them what happened? But then you'd be like, well, because no one's going to believe you. Yeah. You know, and then sometimes whenever they have do that in movies where someone does explain, and then like much like in Christine actually is guilty of this a little bit, <laughs> yeah. where uh, Lee is explaining to um, the other dude, like the dude, like Dennis. about the Dennis, yeah, about about the car, and he believes her way too easily, yeah, about it, uh, which is a problem. So it's it's good that they don't do that, yeah, in this, but. Yeah, this film definitely has like it's got the sequelitis problem of just being it's a victim of the success of the first film. Yeah, where they they are trying to um, reference the first film and the, even like the way they have the structure of it, they have be the same and the way they have have this final confrontation in an historic uh, New York landmark. Yeah, in the same way. And that final confrontation, I think, in this movie kind of sucks. Yeah. I don't like how this movie ends. No. And I especially don't like the very, very end of it. Um, the the painting. What the the fact that the, oh, yeah. the painting that is possessed by Vigo, who we have barely talked about Vigo, the possessed oh, yeah. painting. It, like, yeah, which is the important part of this for us to yeah. get out of our current predicament. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> so, like, I mean, as far as Vigo... Uh, the car the Carpathian goes. I mean, <laughs> he's just this sort of caricature that he feels a lot like Vlad the Impaler or something like he, that. You he's know, basically just Rasputin because uh, yeah, the way they, they talk how about they him, tried to mm, kill him in yeah. all the ways that Ras- Rasputin was like, tried. shot, stabbed, drowned, poisoned. <laughs> yeah. Which is apparently yeah, all those things apparently were like how, what happened to Rasputin before they eventually. I think. I think Rasputin, as far as the mythos around him goes, I think they eventually drowned him in the river. I just put salt was, on him. Uh, they just put salt on him and he just yeah. dissolved. He was like actually a slug. A slug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they have that whole thing and he's this cartoonish sort of thing. And, you know, the best things with him are his interactions with Peter McNichol. Yeah. Uh, being like, command me, Lord, command <laughs> yeah. me. He is Vigo. All that stuff is done through him and he's interesting. I, 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 I love how he I love how he breaks Janos immediately. <laughs> yeah, he's just like he is. There's, there's, there's very little convincing that needs to happen <laughs> no. with him to become the thrall. Yeah, he's just he's like a hundred percent in on it almost from the beginning. Uh, but so like as a as a villain, I think Vigo's kind of sucks. Oh, he's crap. But he, yeah, he doesn't have much to do, and then the confrontation at the end feels very sort of just functional. Yeah, and they have this sort of moment where ray gets possessed which i guess is supposed to be this like which they see a little earlier in the movie when yeah. ray is examining the picture and he gets this sort of weird sort of He's, zombified expression Vigo, on his Vigo face seems to be able to yeah i, I would say weak-minded people are like kind of easily led because ray is kind of they paint him as intelligent but maybe a bit naive so yeah he's a little bit easy manipulated like they do that in the scene where uh, he's doing the research for Dana and yeah. she has asked him not to tell Peter that <laughs> yeah. 
that she's doing it and then all he has to do is he just grabs him by the ears and yep. lifts him up that's all it he's takes. like who is it who's tell me tell me tell me tell me tell me and then he breaks immediately <laughs> yeah so they do they do communicate that so there so is much, a certain but... kind of person Vigo can kind of entrance almost yeah um i i do i, I do love though the <clears throat> there's a, a scene with uh janos just just before i think they capture dana and the baby um mm. where vigo's painting vigo always like says his name and his titles and he's got all yeah, these he titles introduces i am vigo <laughs> i am vigo lord of carpathia yeah, sorrow, yeah. Of Mal- sorrow of moldavia <laughs> yeah and y- Janos like, is like yes yes i i heard it i yeah yeah yes, I've heard, yes said the that sorrow before. yes yes the sorrow yeah, it just it just this. it just makes me think of like you know those kind of difficult video games that uh you have to sit through the boss fight cutscene every time yeah, you die every time he like, beats yep, you yep, you yep, have to on, watch yeah, yeah. You have to watch this guy orate before you <laughs> yeah. get to go in and die again and have to watch the cutscene again. Yeah, and he's like, he's heard this a million times and he's sick of it. Yeah. Like, you imagine he's heard it off screen a lot already. <laughs> yeah. He's very good at that. He's uh, they, they communicate that, I think, fairly well that, you know, he has been talking to this painting a lot and even they have him in the background sometimes yeah. discussing things with the painting. You don't know what he's saying, but no. he's over there speaking like when they go to the museum and Bill Murray first time goes to the museum and that she's like oh i don't like that painting and they look over and he's standing there having a full-on conversation <laughs> with the painting and you're like yeah yeah we need to do something about this and i, I think that I, I read as well again whether it's true or not but uh peter mcnichol was the 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 one who made the choice to make uh janos kind of he, he was only meant to be he was meant to be called jason apparently and he mm. was just very he was a non-character he was just pretty much there to be the thrall of uh vigo but he he was pushing to like kind of make this like ridiculous you know whatever he is <laughs> like, over the top weirdo. Pan global accent yeah wherever the hell he's from i don't know <laughs> yeah he's generically he's generically eastern european <laughs> yeah. he could be russian he could be polish he could be like i don't and, know and yet I, he's neither and yet he is neither he's <laughs> from new york apparently he's from the upper west side as he says <laughs> But, yeah, uh, so he's I, I he's think, great. I think they would have lost a lot if he hadn't made that decision. You know, yeah, because he he does add a lot of life, especially to those Vigo scenes, because Vigo mm. is, as you said, just very boring, very to yeah. the numbers, and he's is literally there just to have something for the Ghostbusters to to do. Yeah, he's the MacGuffin. Yeah, he's just he's the thing that. All oh, right, well. If we defeat him, it will solve the problem of the slime. Exactly. And that's it. That's all he is. So, and he doesn't have much to say. He doesn't have anything important to say or do. All we know is that he wants a baby so that he might live again. Yeah. So they need to steal Dana Barrett's baby. And then they have a bit of a confrontation with him. And he goes, they blast him a bit. And then he goes back into the, they spray him with the positive slime. He goes back into the painting. They spray that. <laughs> Uh, Ray gets possessed pointlessly. They just hose him down, and that's yeah. fine. It's and it's then, it's like a couple of seconds, and that's dealt yeah. with. Yeah, and you're like, well, that was nothing. And then the painting, which I think is the part of the movie that I hate the most, yeah. is that painting because it's stupid. It's not funny. No, it's just sort of like why, like the painting turns into the painting of ego turns into a painting of the ghostbusters and the baby yeah dana's, uh, D- not, dana's not yeah dana's dana is 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 just really sharply absent from the picture <laughs> you'd, you'd mean, expect her to be in it the mother no. of the child is not important everyone no, knows appar- that. Yeah, apparently not <laughs> no and then and literally you see this picture and you think okay that's i guess the first time i saw it i probably was like oh ha huh, that's the ghostbusters in a painting yeah but like i look at it now and i'm like that's stupid. Yeah, it's that's dumb. Why did that happen? I'm Who... also not a massive fan of the, apart from the music that plays during it, but mm. the Statue of Liberty scene also makes me kind of mm. equal parts confused and just like, really, like, are Americans that patriotic that if the Statue of Liberty walked through, <laughs> I'd be terrified. Sick? Yeah. I'd be horrified yeah. by that. That is 
terrifying. That is not a like an ex- that would not be an inspiring vision. <laughs> that would be oh no, it's a big monster. I'm trying to think of the equivalent, uh, especially for, in for a our world town, like no, the big fish. A, if it comes in a world where people are probably still scarred from the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. <laughs> yeah slaughtering people and being on fire and destroying everything it's like being a huge walking disaster and now we have again it's again weirdly referential to the first film in a way of this big huge tall thing stomping through the streets like godzilla in new york in the first one it's step off marshmallow man and it's evil in this one it's the statue of liberty and i guess it's supposed to be a good thing but to me it's it's a horrifying thing yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's playing, it's playing a really good song, so uh, it, it yeah. must be all right. It must yeah. be fine, apart from that uh, police car that it stands on. That it completely squishes, and then, but then they apologize for it, so haha, it's funny. <laughs> um, but it is again, it's, it's self-referential in, a, in that same way that it's just like the only reason this is in here is because there was a scene in the first one, yeah, like this, and the only reason that the confrontation against vigo at the end is structured in the way it is is because that's how the fight went against gozer the gozerian yeah in the first one uh but it's all done in like almost this sort of abridged way where it's like let's just get through this so we can it's, end it's all the very film. rushed at the end it's yeah like yeah, you expect so, something because v- vigo literally materializes in front of them and you're yep. expecting something but apparently the positivity of new york yeah, everybody's uh, heard singing a enough? song. It's like, is it our Lang Syne? Because it's New Year's yeah. Eve. The whole thing is it New Year's Eve. And yeah. oh, at the stroke of midnight, uh, it, this all has to arbitrarily has to happen at this by the stroke of midnight, apparently. <laughs> uh, there's no reason given why. Vigo just says it. Yeah. And that's that's it. But um, yeah, it all just sort of, it all just sort of peters out, I feel, at the end. It doesn't feel that dramatic. And then no. you have that painting that makes me feel bad when I look at it because I'm just like, what is the, why? <laughs> That's a, it's, it's just, it, it, the painting annoys me yeah. because it's, it doesn't make any sense that it exists. <laughs> and it's just this, it almost feels really egotistical. Yeah. Oh, look at us, aren't we the great saviors? And it's just, I'm like, oh, I could do without that. And then you have sort of like, they try to do, they do the end the same way they do the first one where they're like leaving the building to yeah. the cheering people while the credits are coming up yeah, al- uh, almost like kind of semi documentary style that they're yeah you know it's showing you them just walking through this crowd kind of thing yeah and then you get the sort of sitcom ending stuff of like seeing the various stars stop and look at the camera and their names coming up yeah <laughs> and uh, weird cut footage. In fact, there's a bit of cut footage. There's a bit that they use in the credits that I'm pretty sure is a bit of B-roll from the first movie because yeah. it's like there's a point. Uh, maybe it's a uh, maybe it's in Central Park, but there's a point in the first movie during the whole montage, which they do again in this movie. Again, yeah. talking about structurally identical things. The point where they suddenly become popular and successful, and you have like a montage of them catching different ghosts. Yeah, and you're supposed to imply that they're successful now. In the first movie, when they do that, there's a point where there's like a, a runner in the park. Yes. Running around this track. And I think it's probably somewhere in Central Park. So maybe that people would recognize that. I don't know. But they, they're waiting for him and then they catch him in the trap. Yeah. There's a bit of the footage in the credits with them. And I'm pretty sure it's from that scene in the first film. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's them dressed in their winter coats like they are in the first film, waiting, and they're like disguised as hobos, I think, waiting for the runner to come in, and then that's there for some reason. I guess they just had that on the cutting room floor, and they just thought they'd slap it in in the credits, and I find that really confusing <laughs> as someone who's watched the first Ghostbusters a lot, <laughs> recognizing this, what seemingly almost seemed like footage from the first film slapped into the second film at some yeah. point, but it's only in the credits, I don't maybe that's just me. Well, no, the, the version I watched, I think they had that in in the uh the montage scene of the second one as well really yeah no. hmm. i'm nearly sure that that happened and like again i don't know what i might have watched a strange version of it <laughs> but uh no they they definitely had the the, the, the runner going through and really because that's def- that's from the first movie yeah like you know that's in the first film because that, that's, that's the really thing weird. like I, 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 you know I forget 
I, again, I, I said something about uh, not remembering if the Titanic was in the first or the second one mm-hmm. until I watch it again. But uh, yeah, that that kind of stuff. I, I mix up so much of these movies, even though I do remember enjoying the first one a yeah. lot more. I think the fact that it's so self-referential and that it follows the same structure uh, maybe uh, lends itself towards muddling up details yeah. from the first and second film. Uh, I will say that the first film is an order of magnitude better than this film. <laughs> I still think this film is is pretty watchable and is quite funny. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, the problem is that with any sequel, you're going to compare it to the first film, and the first film is just better than this film in every conceivable way uh, and the way that it, it is written how funny it is the way it looks the effects uh, the story is better the villain is way better yeah um, there's, there's a lot more sort of touchstone villainous touchstones in the first movie yeah because the, Vigo never one. really he mm. never really does anything he kind of lets the slime do do his dirty work essentially um, yeah but he is a real non-character, you know. He's, yeah, which is Whereas a shame because your villain, yeah. you've got so yeah. much you can do with villains. Like, yeah, in the first film, you have Zool, which is like the dog thing that is this constant harassment of uh, Dana, yeah, uh, Sigourney Weaver's character in the first film. She's being so you have that. That's a villain, the weird dog thing that's like living in her refrigerator or whatever <laughs> the hell it is. That's trying to get her, and then you have like. Like so, she's being intimidated by that, and then you have all the spooky goings on on the roof, and like that's something. Whereas in this one, you've sort of got Janosch, I guess, who's not intimidating at all. No, they try to make him scary, but the yeah, the, the torches he, in his eyes. Yeah, that looks stupid. And <laughs> I remember thinking that looked cool when I was a kid. Yeah, and seeing it now, it's like, oh, that looks kind of rubbish. <laughs> um, in fact, a lot of things about this movie are, are like I remember being young and watching it. I think they're great, like the Statue of Liberty walking around and stuff like that. But now I see that and I'm like, I don't know about this, lads. Yeah. Um, this is like the first film, but not as good. <laughs> it invites comparison. It and does. Inviting so, comparison to something like Ghostbusters is very unwise because Ghostbusters is a great film. Yeah. The most important yeah. question, of course, is uh, mm-hmm. what Ghostbusters is, is, is most like you? character wise everybody wants to say peter but i know it's ray (laughs) i know it's ray and like ray was always kind of my favorite in the cartoon (laughs) i think i really like ray uh whenever i was a kid i remember one christmas uh we got proton packs yeah uh like we plastic proton packs and my mom wrote the initials of our favorite ghostbusters on on the little straps we asked her to and mine said rs because i wanted to be ray stan so bad because i thought he was great because he knew all this stuff and he was really likable yeah so i think everybody wants to say peter but i always i, I always it, yeah, lean towards just... ray like well, the, the older i get the more kind of i realize yeah peter's a no, it, actually Dana says this in the movie uh, Peter is an awful ro- road mo- role model sorry I can't speak yeah she says that about the kid like he's this is a terrible role model for yeah. you Oscar she says to the baby and you have to agree and you're kind of going you know what yeah Peter's, yeah, Peter's he is. terrible Peter kind of sucks but he's a great character he's a brilliant oh, character oh he is brilliant yeah he's so fun to watch and, he, and I mean a lot, a lot of that is it, he has the charisma to pull it off I mean Bill Murray yeah is nothing if not charismatic so mm-hmm. uh yeah it wouldn't work it, it it wouldn't work with uh anyone else really no i i don't i i well i mean i'm sure there's probably other actors that could have played the role yeah. but i can't imagine it no i i find it impossible to imagine someone being peter venkman <laughs> that isn't bill murray because he's just like and you, you get the sort of like you get the feeling like when you watch that movie like multiple times that you're just like did they have a script for this or did they just let bill murray walk into this room and just do whatever <laughs> like the first the scene in the first one when he first goes to dana barrett's apart, apartment and he has this squishy wee like device <laughs> where he's squeezing the wee ball <laughs> and he's walking around like you just feel like the, the way he's getting on there you're just like this is just bill murray's just going for it <laughs> yeah. bill murray's just like Sigourney Weaver is having to deal now with Bill Murray just vamping and is doing her best to keep up with him and it's funny <laughs> to watch that happen and I think that's that's what makes Peter Venkman such a great character yeah I think is that it's it's 
Bill Murray has decided this is what this guy's like and yeah. I'm going to play him this way and it's just great. I think it works so well. Yeah. All right, so now we're down to the brass tacks then of which of these three movies do we think is the best movie? Now, my vote is 100% definitely going for Ringu, I think. I have to completely completely agree. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. I thought you were going to disagree with me there. I was gonna be like, oh, this is going to be a debate. Yeah. We're going to actually no, discuss I mean, this. I mean, we, we went on about even just the importance of it uh, above and beyond the, the film itself. You know. Yeah, cultural impact, let's say, That's that it has the had. words, yeah. Mm. Look at you, Mr. Smarty Man. I know. Ooh. But, uh, yeah, but even even divorced from that, it it's just an enjoyable movie. It's yeah, it's the most competently done as well. You know, the yep. the other two suffered a lot from, again, or the usual gripe is pacing. Yeah. Um, or the Ghostbusters that was just the, like the cash grabbiness and the kind of yeah. the, we we had issues with it. But uh, I think even though Ringu's very slow, mm-hmm. it it does it purposely purpose i can i cannot speak purposefully there we go indeed <laughs> and uh it it benefits from it in the long run so yeah I yeah think- it's 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 one of the best slow burn movies that there is especially like for a slow burn horror movie yeah it's very tempting for a horror film to want to get to scare an audience as often as possible yeah uh whereas ring i mean it does sort of at the beginning you get sort of a scare at the beginning you get like Close a few, few reflections in TV screens, which again is the, yeah. I I love I, I love that kind of uh, like uh, scary stuff of like you see things out of the corner of your eye and yeah. you know stuff like that freaks me out more than you know the ghost kind of just being there going hey how you doing. Yeah, like jumping out of a cupboard and trying yeah. to eat somebody's face. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Whereas like something subtle in the background, like my yeah, one of my favorite things to happen in horror and you addressed this before in a previous episode when we were talking about uh the conjuring 2 yeah uh where there's a scene in the conjuring 2 where it's girls come downstairs in the middle of the night bad crack and she sits down on a sofa and then there's this moment where you suddenly realize that the whole time there has been this old man Mm -hmm. in the background in the corner of the screen yeah hiding like just sitting there not moving and then he just sort of moves a bit and you suddenly realize oh my god he's there he's been there the whole time yep um which is the thing that um even though it wasn't like on the whole it wasn't necessarily a great film but there's a uh, the woman in black yeah does that a fair bit and it's based on it's a melodrama and there's been a stage play of that yes that yeah. apparently that i would like to see that apparently does a lot of that like they do some clever stuff during the stage play with lighting or apparently you'll be sitting there for like an entire scene of people talking and if you are astute enough to notice that you will see that the woman in black has been on the stage the entire time and you just haven't noticed yeah yeah so there's something to be said for again the byword with this film is subtlety 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 it is just it doesn't shove things in your face until it needs to yeah Uh, for the most most of it you're just sort of sitting there going where's this going (laughs) and you're you're hearing people talk about things and you're like that's creepy and the more you learn the creepier it becomes yeah but they never get to the point where they're never shoving a huge amount of information down your throat they drip feed it yeah and then by the time it becomes most important you know everything you need to know yeah and it's horrifying and again, I cannot stress enough. I love that practical effect. I don't want to say what it is, just in case. <laughs> I don't want to. It's the, it's something that shouldn't be spoiled. Um, and it just it just looks so good. It just looks so real. You know, it's not over the top. It's not crazy. It's just that looks like it's actually happening. And I love it so much. Yeah. It's just gorgeous um so yeah i think this film is successful in everything it sets out to do uh i think the way they employ music in it is very restrained um most of the time it's just atmospheric sounds rather than music 
Mm-hmm. Um, there is sort of a bad kind of song over the credits. But <laughs> that, that, that is yeah, no we relevance. didn't touch on, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, really it has no relevance really to the film it's, at it's all. It's kind of a bit like the Event Horizon music, uh, uh, the techno at the start and the yeah. end, where it's like it's a bit silly, but I can ignore it because it's just the credit sequence. Yeah, uh, that's fine. That doesn't bother me at all. So yeah, I think pretty definitively, I think yeah, Ringu is the best of these three movies. Christine's fun. Uh, when it wants to be, it's very fun <laughs> and cre- creepy, and some, but it also is inconsistent, and um, I don't think a lot of the characters. There's some just bad characters in it, and it's not done very well developed. <laughs> yeah. But I, it's a film that, and it flubs the ending. Like the whole like last final act is Stephen King's kind of, kind of infamous for that as well. Though. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah. They even made a really bad joke about that in the, that latest It Chapter 2 yeah, movie. And then they managed yeah. to fluff the end. And, of and they managed to just do exactly the same yeah. thing. Yeah, Acknowledging it doesn't make the problem go away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. When you still have that problem, it doesn't fix it just by saying we know this is crap, here you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's got those problems. And Ghostbusters 2 I think, again, it's it's a slave to the first film and its structure and its references and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think that works very well uh, because of those things. So, um, yeah, Ring is the best movie. Yeah. Easily, I think. So, as far as which of these films is going to help us out in defeating or getting rid of possessed objects from taking our lives i think this one's a no-brainer as well because only one out of the three movies actually Mm -hmm. defeats their possessed item very true i had this exact (laughs) thought as well because if we're gonna say we should acknowledge that like so with ring they pass on yeah they turn it into a virus essentially yeah it doesn't get solved um in Christine, there is a crappy moment at the end <laughs> yeah. after they have put the car in the crusher that the car then you hear the radio switch on inside. Yeah. Well, you don't. You think they do a fake out with that. Oh, yes. The radios yeah, come on. Right, yeah. And it's actually a guy walking past with a ghetto blaster. But then you have that thing where you get a close up and it holds on it. And they actually do this kind of okay where it holds on it for a, a while. Before you start to see a bit of, I think it's like a little bit of the trim or the fender starts to bend back into position. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, it's not dead. Let's just carry on. You know, because that's a car that heals itself. Yeah. Well, it, now, it, it, I am I am assuming that the one you're going for here is Ghostbusters too, yeah. because they defeat the evil. It, yes. it, it very and in, in Christine, it very much establishes that Christine can heal herself. Yeah. She's been in multiple states of disrepair. So like when they find her, she's would, really fucked up. Yeah, why yeah. would you think being in a cube? Like, you've no evidence to show that. So yeah, yep. uh, just what you're saying. Ghostbusters 2 is the only one where they actually get rid of the problem, albeit yeah. a bit undramatically. Yeah, the possessed object eventually becomes dispossessed. Yeah. Now, they don't really, they just sort of seem to drown Vigo in positivity, I guess is the idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it does it does ostensibly destroy him. So uh, we just have to be positive to get rid of yeah. possessed well, items. All we have to do is, if we all, i.e. you and I, <laughs> gather round. And, oh, yeah, I, yeah. If we all just sort of gather around, we sing positive songs. And if we can, um, is there a way that we can positively charge some, we don't really have any slime. No, <laughs> no. Um, just spit on them. Right, okay, you know what? Let's say positive things while we spit at possessed <laughs> objects. All right, and if we survive that, then I guess or we'll be back we're, here. We're missing just the, the simplest solution here. Just mm-hmm. call the Ghostbusters. Oh my gosh, of course. Yeah. Why didn't I think of that before? Who are you going to call? I hate to say the cliche, but you know what? To quote Peter Venkman, sometimes shit happens. <laughs> Someone has to deal with it. And who you gonna call? Yeah. 